All right, what's good, Gilly? I just want to say it's an honor to have you here today on Panda Chop News. I appreciate you taking time out your day to do me this solid and let me get your story, man. So for the people that are not familiar with you, can you just uh, please introduce yourself and your relation to the late, great, big pun? Yeah, my name is Gilly uh, Pure and um, from the Bronx, New York. And um, a pun was my man, I, you know, uh, he was my man, personal assistant and um, wound up being his road manager and just more working hand in hand with him. Mm -hmm. So what age were you when you met Big Pun and how did you meet him? Yeah, I was in my mid twenties. Um, I, I was in my mid twenties. Like I said, he came from the Soundview side of the Bronx, and um, <clears throat> went up on this side, on the south, on the more south side of the Bronx, uh, around from my area towards Prospect, which is Fox Street, Prospect, Forest, High, Forest Avenue, Forest Projects, you know, Little Vills, shit like that. Yep. So when you met him, was Cuban already around with him at the time? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I met them all together, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was your relationship with Cuban like? Cuban's my, always been my little man. Like, Cuban, he's always been my little man. Um, You know, I you know, I come from a different walk. You know what I mean? Something I, I, you know, we don't talk too much about. But, you know, I, I was outside as a young kid always. So that's the new phrase everybody uses. I'm outside, right? So right. I was outside. And, um, you know, you know, you meet people when everybody's outside. So I had a good relationship. I used to see them, you know, they was up and, you know, they was popping. They was good kids. And, um, and you know, um, actually Cuban used to work in the barbershop too as well. And, and he used to cut my hair when I had hair. So, you know, that's how I built the relationship with them and with Sace. Used to play baseball, softball. You know, we all from the same vicinity. So, you know, we always see each other in, in parks and jams, you know, block parties and shit like that. You know, you bump into people, you just driving by, you drive through blocks. You know, like they say, you spinning blocks and, you know, you see fellas outside, you stop, you kick it, you talk, smoke, drink, bullshit. You know what I mean? The way of the city. So did you meet Cuban first before a uh, pun or you met them at the same time? No, I met them all at the same time called my cousin, the sick one. Uh, he was the fully clips member and um, he used to rap with them. So that's kind of how I got familiar with them through my cousin. Cause he's from, he was from forest and he's original terror squad, my cousin Toon, the sick one. And um, that's how, you know, I got to meet them. Uh, but I met them all together, like basically like at the same time. And uh, what was your first impression of Pun and Cuban at that time? Just regular shit. Like, I didn't know Pun rapped. I didn't know Cuban rapped. I was just, it was just some regular shit. It was just regular homeboy shit, you know, growing up in the same hoods. And and it was, it was just some regular shit. I didn't know they rapped. I, I really didn't. And are you older than them? So, like, when you met them, were they like... Yeah, 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 yeah. I was much older than them. I was already, like I said, I was almost in my prime. I was already in my mid to late twenties when I met them. And so, when I hear you speak about pun, right? Because I've seen uh, the Doggy Diamonds interview. I hear, yeah. Shout out first off. Wait before we go. Shout out to my dog, Doggy Diamond. Love him. If you ever see this, Doggy, you already know what it is. And shout out to you, Panda. You're the only, you're the second person I ever gave an interview to. I really don't do this. Right. Respect to you for that, man, and respect to Doggy Diamonds. Um, when I hear you speak about pun, I hear genuine love and some hurt there because like you genuinely were out there trying to take care of your friend, right? You were close to his family. Uh, did you ever have any moments of like, I wish I did this or could have done this? Sometimes we put that guilt on ourselves when it's not warranted. Not necessarily. I just, um, I, I should have had, uh, more of a like a bull a bull rider's effect you feel me like i should have just i took a lot of chances and, and i tried my best but you know with pun is you know pun was sensitive i wasn't a yes man upon at all so you know you know we had our little you know you know we used to have our little you know our little conversations i'm not even gonna say arguments because we ain't never argue like that dog you know what i mean but now there's nothing I would I would want to do different. I mean, other than just like put my foot down and and go bananas, but w I don't know what effect that would have had. You feel me? So I played my position basically. Right, and and you you believe that everything happens for a reason, right? So what happened was meant to happen. Well, God is in control of everybody's life, man. So 
whatever he says goes, you know what I'm saying? Like, of course we would like to change, you know, that the pattern, but that's, that's just destiny. You can't fool with destiny at all. You can have dreams of tomorrow, but it's not promised. Do you ever think about what pun would be doing now if he was still here? Yeah, he'd probably be one of the biggest rap mogul executives in the world right now. He'd have put everybody on because that's what it was his ambition was, was to he had a great heart. And especially with the Spanish, the reggaeton movement, you know, he he foresaw that ahead of his time, even though it was underground at the time and only in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, but you know, he he always gave and paid homage to Puerto Rico, uh, because that's where we came from. And then, you know. Always, we always listened to reggaeton, but it was very underground music. Like it was very underground. But you know, he he saw, you know, he, he a lot of rappers used to use Spanish lingos in their songs anyway. So how how comfortable it was for him because he is Latino. So he he knew how to mix the words better than anybody that tried it in the past. So you know, which would open the door for you know the the Latino artists that came way uh, shortly after him passing away and you've known joe since you were a little kid right yeah. what was that relationship like growing up joe and i we we grew up together we grew up in the same neighborhood actually i met joe he was about 12 maybe 10 11 something like that um I, I say 10 but it was around that time like you know we played little league together he was actually on my little league team but i didn't you know we just knew him as joey and, you know, and then through the years, you know, he, you know, I knew Joe too, the street person, you know, he was outside definitely all the time as well. Mm -hmm. And I know his mom and God rest his soul, his sister, which was a very, very, very good friend of mine, you know what I'm saying? And so, you know, it was like that. And it seems like there's like some internal conflict that you feel with Joe, because on one hand, you knew him since you guys were so young. And you knew his family and everything. But then you look back at some of the things he did in relation to Terror Squad and you're left a little confused. Again, destiny. T today's key word is destiny. Destiny played itself um, confused. Um, not, I, I wouldn't say I'm confused. I would say um, more understanding the differences of people's thoughts and, and mental capacity and and their movement on, you know, what, you know, what I think you may not think, you know what I'm saying? Or what you think, you may think I'm thinking like that as well. <laughs> you dig what I'm saying? So if you, if you, if you think in, if you have a mischievous brain, you feel me, then you think everybody outside is trying to get you. Me, I had a, a open book, open, you know, transparent policy. Like what you see is what you get. But with, with a thought. I mean, I, I have a brain. I'm not from the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> I have a brain. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I have a heart. You know what I mean? So, you know, um, you know, we have differences, but you know, I mean, the way it played out is the way it's supposed to be, I suppose. And so because you knew Joe at such a young age, did you know Charlie Rock L D back then as well? Yeah, well, I knew a lot of Charlie Rock L D. We 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 come from different blocks, but yeah, Charlie Rock LD is, uh, yeah, he's, he was definitely another person that, you know, was, was in this, was around as a young dude growing up in the Bronx, you know, his name rang bells, um, you know, then he went into the system, his name rang bells in there. And I actually used to go visit him. I went like, I think two on two different occasions to visit him with Joe, um, yeah, and that's how I really got introduced to Charlie Rock. I actually went up north and I, I, I visited him with Joe and, and we got to know each other much better. And then um, then when he came home, you know, he came home to a great situation and we respected each other's lane. But yeah, a brother, they all are my brothers, even though, you know, even though we don't talk, bro, but, you know, I, I would consider all of them my brothers um, in a sense. But there's a lot of, you know, we need a, a family. We would we, we would have to need a good family sit down amongst us, you know, to, you know, you know, to wind out what happened, what went wrong. If it's necessary, if it's not, just let it be, man. Dudes is living, dog. Like, you know, it's, 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 I'm, we living, man. I'm living, dog. Like, I'm not, I, I don't get caught up. I, I do this with respect because, you know, you asked me to and, and, you know, Cuban sent you my way. 
And um, but I, I can't keep reflecting over twenty three years of what's been going on. You know, like like the world is involved. It's like it's really nobody's business, but our own. And you know the fans don't want to see that. The fans want to see some type of unity, because music and you know it's make you it's supposed to make you feel good, make you it's supposed to feel family orientated, you know. And that that's not necessarily the ish the, the the situation here, the picture. But um, you know, I believe that um, you know, that's all internal, dog. It was really not for everybody to 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 know. It was supposed to have been handled at home by ourselves, within ourselves. But as you can see, when things like that happen in public, it's actually a changing of the guard, a changing of the minds, a changing of the direction, and not everybody's involved. So I, I don't, I'm not bitter about none of that. I actually enjoy my life now, and I enjoyed my life when I was there. Like it was fun. Like I, you know, I worked and I, I got to travel and, and and do music and entertain. I, I enjoyed it. Right. And so um, when you, you earlier you had said that Joe was definitely outside, right? Like he was definitely involved in everything. Uh, when I interviewed Charlie, he had said that Joe was never really about that life. He never put in work. Can you confirm if what he's saying is true or? Well, they, well, they, well, well they have a deeper relationship. You know what I'm saying? Like they come from that side. Like when I say, you know, when Joe was outside, like, yeah, when we was in jams, we was in different clubs, you would see him, like, as far as whatever they did, you know, extracurricular for their own personal being, you know, I, that's not, that wasn't my cup of tea. That's not what I'm into. You know what I'm saying? I'm into, I, I'm into other things. I wasn't into, you know, being on my block every day. Like, it's, nah, I'm moving. I'm, I'm moving, dog. Like, I don't stay on my block. I live on my block. I just don't stay there. You feel me? So, you know, if, if when Charlie said, I'm not going to sit here and, and, and get to say, now nah, he, no, nah, Charlie would know that part of him better than me. You know what I'm saying? I was outside. I know my guy, I'm everywhere. So, I mean, but I, you know, you know, what I did growing up is a lot different than what other people did. You know what I mean? So I, I, I once saw you said that pun didn't just die from obesity, right? But he died from a broken heart. It seemed like Pun had a lot of people that loved him in his life. Uh, you mentioned his mom, his grandma, um, his wife, Liza, of course. Uh, what did you mean by that uh, brokenhearted part? Well, I mean, you know, when you have conversations with each other, you know what I'm saying? And, you, and, you know, you, uh, you, you release your tension and, and, and memories and things that make you feel a certain type of way. We used to, we used to match that. Right. So, you know, my overall analyzation of it, right, was that, you know, you know, we come from a broken home. We come from, you know, not saying that our parents never loved us, but there was no time. Like it was no, you know, it was no, no, it was tough love. You feel me? Like it was tough love. They still provided a roof over our head, but, you know, it was like no put it to you like this, man. There's a lot of kids. There's a lot of people that grow up in this world that come from great homes and have everything at home, but they still want to be outside and do what dudes outside are doing outside because they have nothing. And then they do that just to bring something home. So that was us. We used to have to be out there to eat and to survive. You feel me? By any means necessary. And then bring it, bring it home. But you know, you, you know, some parents have other ideas. They have children and they're not still they, they're not ready to be adults on their own so they have things that they do so yeah i mean just coming from a broken home just coming from you know single parent home a stepdad you know stepdads all dog they don't give a fuck about you you know what i mean they may act like they do cuz they with your mother but you know they you know they they do shit so you know you just grow up you know that's the that's the hand that we was dealt and that's the hand he was dealt but he changed his hand to four aces so that's why I love him, bro, because you know what? He he inspired me to live for something. You know what I mean? And he continues to inspire me to live, you know, but he loved his mom. His mom loved him. His grandma adored him. His sisters adore him. Um, you know, the family, the, 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 the us adore him. His fans adore him. So, you know, that's the love that he got from all of those other people. He wanted it from his family. 
but it was impossible because I'm not saying it was all one sided. It took to both sides to balance the beam. You know? Yeah. Uh, to be fair to his mom, you know, as minorities, when our parents come to this country, it's tough, you know, and they lock in so much sometimes and trying to make it and provide a better life for the family. They sometimes lose sight of uh, providing what their kids need the most. And that's like showing them that affection. Right. And um, I feel like minority families sometimes feel like if they show too much of it, that their kids will grow up soft. Yeah. Well, that's why he was, but that's why he was definitely militant around his children because, you know, his children, you know, he prepared them way past what they knew what life was. It, it was hard, but now they understand, you know, why he would probably be so hard on them at that time. Because really, you know, as much as you say you got boys and people, you don't really got nobody, Doug. If you ain't got God alone, you know, God is just going to who's going to provide good people and take away bad people from your life. Sometimes you feel lonely and empty, but it's for a reason. So, you know, as, as I got older and as I get older, you know, I, I, I find more understanding of life because nobody said life was going to be easy. And like you said, growing up in a minority home, we're not prepared for life. We always baby Goo Goo Gaga, you know, buying you, you know, buying your kid, you know, Jordans and, and Louis because them shits is like only like, you know, cheaper than what they were actually cause. And your kid is wearing Jordans all day. He's only like eight months old and then he's one year two year three year he still see jordan's on his feet when he gets to that age that's all he really know now you look at now you look at other parents you not now you look at other parents and you know they, they set up bank accounts you know what i'm saying like they set up bank accounts for their kids they give their kids skippies and they give them the bell bottom and the kids don't even care how they look but you know what when they get older they don't care for the fashions and the and uh you know and I guess in the glamour stuff of life, you feel what I'm saying? Am I? Do I make sense in that? Like, am I making sense in, in a way like to you? Like, definitely. You know, I feel like uh, in the hip hop kind of space, like we wear our wealth, right? Like the priorities is is a little is a little out of whack because I feel like when you grow up in the inner city, you see you looking at the world from a different perspective where people have all these riches, so you kind of want to feel included in that. Right, right, but look, right, but let me give you a scenario, right? Growing up in the 80s here in the Bronx, like Timberlands was only $50, bro. Rappers made Timberlands $160, $260. You know what I'm saying? The the the, the jeans, the Levi jeans and the and the Lee jeans, it was only twenty, thirty dollars. You feel me? So, you know, the hoodie was only $10, $20. You know, the baseball cap or the ski hat was only $3. So, you know, that's what rappers wore. It was our everyday clothing. Now, what happens? The capitalists, they see the capitalism off of it and how to capitalize off of us all the time. So they're like, oh, shit, you know what? Now that's a necessity. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's on demand. So what happens when something is on demand? You raise the price. Right. So the same Timberlands and all of that, like, bro, people wasn't trying to wear, you know, Louis and Gucci and all that because that wasn't the style of hip hop. Later on, Biggie, God bless his soul, and Puffy, they made it into that fashion. Like, you know, Biggie was a big boy, so you had to throw him in something nice. Pun two was a big boy. You had to throw him in something nice. You feel me? So you, now you get your tailors, and then they throw the Gucci splash on it or the Louis splash on it. You know, like Dapper Dan was the first one before even Gucci and Bossy Lago and all them dudes. Dapper Dan was doing that, cutting from them. Nobody was buying none of that. See, people need to know the origin of hip hop out there in the West Coast. Bro, dudes were still wearing bell bottoms and, and the, you know what I'm saying? Out there, y'all had it different. Y'all, y'all wasn't wearing Timberlands. Y'all was wearing Converse. Them shits was only $16. Them shits was only $16, bro. Try to buy a pair of Converse right now. How much they going to hit you for? Yeah, it's crazy. You see what I'm saying, Dougie? Even those skateboarding sneakers, what they what they called that everybody wearing now? Uh, What's the name of them, sk- them skateboarding sneakers that they got the upside down? Say again? The Vans? Or which one are you talking about? Correct. Correct. The Vans. Niggas wasn't wearing those, bro. <clears throat> so fashion, hip-hop has helped, you know, elevate everybody's pocket. Right, 
For sure. You know? And it still keeps us pioneers alive because when you look at people like us, even though I'm not in the industry light no more, but I'm in the streets and the, and the streets is in the street. So, you know, you just got to change the Y and put some ease on that shit and a T and a, and a T and an S. You know what I mean? But it's all love, bro. Listen, man. It's all, I'm not even, but I, I, I do want to talk about things absolutely with you. It's a conversation and it's a pleasure to meet you too. And I hope you, I hope you much success. I hope you blow the fuck up, bro. I really do. Cause everybody deserves it. I've seen it. I've been to the mountain top and back and up and down and up and down. It's all good. So I feel like, you know, we as people, we all have our own traumas from childhood, right? And if you don't heal from those traumas, they manifest their way in your life in different ways from addiction, certain personality traits. Do you think his relationship, Pun's relationship with his mom contributed to his eating habits? No. No. Pun Pun caught a lawsuit and um, before he even got a music deal and, you know, Pun bought a car and, you know, Pun, he treated himself. He's just being in his car and he treated himself. He had money. So, you know, he got bigger and, um, he didn't exercise and then possibly after that obviously it could have been it could have been in the subconscious that it, it it came to it came to the front and um maybe that was his way of finding a getaway i, I couldn't explain that i'm not a doctor i just know i tried my hardest to minimize that intake of the, the, the type of foods he was eating so I would do more tuna fish sandwiches with lettuce and celery. And, you know, I would try to, I would work hard on implementing that, you know, but to see Pun go to the store and buy Snicker bars and all that. Nah, dog, he was, that was food. That was food. Like it wasn't like no junk candy. Could be a lot of fast food. That, that helps you get big immediately. But yeah, it probably wasn't the song. I'm not going to say no. I'm just saying no, not at the immediate time. Because Pun used to play ball. Pun was agile. You know, Pun dunked. <laughs> Pun dunked the basketball, bro. Like, I literally seen him dunk a ball, bro. So it's like, wow. You know. Yeah, it's kind of crazy so, when you see, like, those younger pictures of him, right? Like, uh, he was he was still fit at one point. Yeah, but I didn't know him. I didn't know him when he was fit, fit like that. I knew him when he was already starting, like, 250, almost close to 300. That's when I he still was agile. He used to box. You know what I'm saying? Play ball. You know, Pun was an athlete. He just got big. What happened with the, his dad? Did he ever talk to you about that? Nah. His stepdad. Stepdad used to just make him do do things he didn't want to do, force him to do things he, he wasn't comfortable doing. Then when he got comfortable doing it, he just did it. You know, as far as being outside in the streets, you know, making money, hustling. That was it. So yeah, he didn't want to do it. But once he had to be out there, he, he was. He did it. He did it. A lot of dudes respected him on Cozy Corner, which is in the back of Soundview over there. And that's 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 real shit over there. So to survive that, you know what I mean. And I remember that's only all blacks and Puerto Ricans. You know where we come from. That before there was there was no other cultures. Not no disrespect to no other cultures, but. All we grew up was black and Puerto Rican, so we was black and Puerto Rican. You couldn't, you know, even the Spanish, you know, you know, you say Moreno means black. So, you know, we talk Spanish and, you know, the black people understood it. But, you know, the same way. It was all love, bro. It was just the only two type of people I grew up around, blacks and Puerto Ricans. So when you say that his dad made him do things that he didn't, his stepdad made him do things that he didn't want to do, you're talking about more like hustling in the streets? Yeah, we're gotcha. Um, so I believe when our loved ones pass, you know, they're like staring down on us and watching us. How do you think Pun feels about the separation of Terror Squad and you know how things have turned out when he's staring down on it? You can see it right. You can see it live out in front of you. It's uh, he's not happy. There's nobody together. There's one side. You know, always bad mouthing. You know, one dude, you know, um, it's, it's, everybody is attacking Cuban. Cuban attacks back. Again, that's something that, you know, is supposed to be in Syria. You know, I, you know, I love the crew, but 
in my eyes, why I made the decision I made because I felt like I've seen everything and being around it, I didn't see Cuban do anything wrong, but just try to get on and show his loyalty and his honor to Pun and to Joe and to the squad. You know, he felt like he was able, that he was going to be able to help keep the torch lit and carry it across continuously until the next thing happens. That's how he felt. So, you know, he, um, that's why I made my decision and to, to, to leave the squad because I, you know, and Pun would never be happy. Pun is not happy. 23 years. You, you see what's going on. Even takes, even takes new journalists to come out and say, Oh, out of left field, like we're not even talking on the topic. And then you come out of left field, like, oh, I would never interview Cuba Link. You know, so the truth is coming out. Oh, because I'm man's with this dude. So you already know, black ball to the 10th power, bro. Like dudes, you know, again, like I said earlier in this interview or in this conversation, because I told you we weren't going to call this an interview. This is our conversation that um that what I think may not necessarily be what you think, but what you think, you may necessarily think I'm thinking like you. Right. You know what I mean? So in other, in other words, if you think, I, if, if you think, oh, I'm just going to, um, Gilly just want to get on me just to get on and get over and be better than me, you're never going to help put me on because that's what you're thinking. But I'm thinking over here like, no, I'm going to add to what you already brought to the table. Together, we're going to build more. You're always going to be on top because you founded us. You founded me. You know what I mean? So no matter if I make $20, you're always going to get yours. No matter if that's for the rest of our life. And then whatever I bring underneath that is you still going to eat. You still going to get paid. So it's the, it's the mentality, brother. You know, the, you know, the ghetto mentality is, is, it's a, it's a lot of I. It's a lot of I, but it is there's, there's I and win. But it's just still you win with a team. Even a boxer has a team. A boxer fights by himself in there, but he has a team. But he's in there to win with the I, but you still need a team. And and then and then also have thoughts of your team and be like, yo, bro, like, what y'all think? You know what I mean? Build. But there was no building. But because we was in the race, too, remember, we was just that a bunch of shot out the water, dog. So it's like shit was just rolling. So we learned. I learned. I learned as I went. But I took the time out to learn. I wasn't I didn't get caught up in the lights. I was actually learning. You know, and that's the sad thing, because, you know, as a team, your success is my success. And, you know, and vice versa. Right. It's like you guys are working together. You're able to contribute to each other. And um, I just think that a lot of times. People don't look at it, look at it that way. There's some ego that gets into the way or, or some jealousy or whatever it may be. So uh, I've seen you mention in, in the, I think the Doggy Diamonds interview that uh, there were people that tried to separate Big Pun from his day ones, right? And at one point they lied on your name and said that, you know, you were stealing money or something like that. And you were separated from Big Pun for a year and a half. Who were the people that tried to separate you? If I, if bro, bro, if I, if I only knew, dog, but if I, I, I know, I, I, if I only knew, I mean, like, I never knew word of mouth. I just knew that when they got back to my cousin, the sick one's mouth or his ears, and he told Pun, he said, nah, dog, that nigga would, that nigga would take that shit from you before he'll steal it from you. So he said, nah, that's not in his heart. He would never do that. So, you know, I guess Pun found out a whole year later who did take the money. And then when he saw me, he gave me $1,000, but I gave it to everybody that, that was helping me survive that uh, during that time off I had with him. So, you know, when he came there, he gave me $1,000. He was like, yo, my bad. Fizz bumped me. I fist bumped him. He grabbed my hand, gave me 1000 And then I went and I gave everybody that was with me $100 a piece. I was about with like seven dudes that held me down. So they were happy. They were happy that we squashed it. But I ain't never had no beef. Like, I ain't never robbed you, bro. Like, I'm, I'm sign my cup of tea, bro. I know how to starve, dog. Like, I don't, I, I don't need to, I, like, again, bro, it goes back to the mind, bro. My brain ain't on it like that, dog. I'm, a, I'm transparent. I give gifts away. I, you know, I, I help people, I fix things. I help people get better. I'm a fixer. So that must have been kind of heartbreaking for you, right? For, for that perception. Oh. 
setbacks. Setbacks, bro. Like, come on, like, it's, it's not what I'm here for. I'm here to work. I'm here to break my back. Like Scarface say, he said he didn't come to the United States to break his back, but in the United States, you got to break your back to be successful. Facts. You see what happened to him? He died for being fucking greedy. I never emulate, I never, that movie, that movie's sending all the wrong messages to me. My perspective of watching the movie. I mean, so it's a setback, of course. You have ideas, you have dreams, like, you know, you want to, you know, you want to build a company, you want to bring ideas to the table. People pay, people, big executives have A&Rs working for them. Why? Because they're looking for new ideas. So you have a, all that built within and you're teaching that within because, you know, Joe had to see all of that to be able to be the executive he is and to be able to manage himself this long. So he knows what every position on the table means. So of course it was taught to me by by the camp, by Flex, God rest his soul, and Mickey Benson, which is Ice T's manager. Bronx River, I come from the original home of the land. Like I just, bro, I didn't even want to, I, I didn't even know I was gonna work in music, bro. Like I didn't grow up saying I want to work in music. Like I'm just on the street. Pun happened to be my man. And happened to blow up, and I said, "Yo, you want to want to work?" And I said, "Sure." It's just that it was that dog. It's not like I was in in the studio breaking nights to help you get a record deal. No, bro, I was in the streets. But when he did make it, because I told him one time, I heard him rapping, and I told him, I I said in the Doggy Diamond interview, <clears throat> I said, "Bro, you serious like that, bro? Like, well, if you ever make it, I'll definitely fuck with you, bro. Like, you need help. You need somebody to really ride with you, like." Like, no hoes balls. I, I ain't looking for nothing. I'm just looking for a way out of my situation. <laughs> you feel me? I'm only looking for a way out of how I'm living, dog. You know what I mean? So, you know what I mean? Not financially, just the way out of how I'm living. You know, my finance has always been out. I'm, I God always enables me to have something for another day. You know, whether it's a little bit or a lot, but I still have something for the next day to eat. Roof over my head. That's important. So all you need is a roof over your head and food on your table. Everything else is secondary. You knew for sure that he found out who took the money. Did he tell you that? He didn't tell you who. No, my, no, no. My cousin did. My, my cousin, the sick one, did tell me. He said he knew. And so during that time, you were still working for Terror Squad, even though he fired you from being his road manager, right? I was I was working with Flex, and then I, I still was still working with with, with uh, Armageddon, uh, obviously helping around with Prospect and Tony Sunshine, and also definitely Cuban. Cuban had a lot of shows because um, of off the books this year, and then Cuban had a lot of shows, and um, we used to do shows with Cuban. Cuban had like. He had shows. He had a lot of shows. People were wanting to book him alone. And so it was like a year and a half that you guys separated at that time? I'd say about a year, like close to like maybe nine, ten months, but that's a year, roughly. I, I had to go work back in the in the there's a store over here called a Jew Man, right? And there's there was a, a family and they were the ones who created who actually were the hosiery place where all this garment that we was created in hip hop, they were the ones who used to sell it, whether it was here in the Bronx with the Jew men, or was it at Canal Street with the same family or in Brooklyn, you know, the same family. They just went out and they were the ones who had all the, the gear, like the Levi's, the Lees, the, you know, the, the Moses Malone's, like they were the ones who created Moses Malone. They're the ones who created Bear. They're the ones who created uh, um, Gore-Tex. They're the ones who created Troop. They were the ones, yeah, bro, we grew up in that right here in the Bronx. Like all them, all them little people created that right there. So we grew up working in their stores. We used to hold them down, make sure nobody robbed them. Actually, uh, one guy that was with Terror Squad, he was like, he, he was, he grew up with them. Uh, he grew up with the, those people, so you know that's how we um, made music. Like that's how shit was made. Like we grew up in it. So I worked back in the Jew man with uh, a brother named Melvin, one of the brothers. Uh, he, in the meantime, you know, everybody was like, "Yeah, it's fucked up." Everybody knew like, "Yeah, it's fucked up." So he said, "Yo, just work here with me." 
So I was like, all right, what you want me to do? No, everybody just hold me down. Gave me $50 a day. So I used to go there every day, hold it down, watch some sell clothes all day, and, you know, and get it, you know, the Timberland boots, all type of shoes, Avrex, um, whatever, Vask, or all type of shit, you know, the hood shit. And I worked every day. He gave me $50 a day. And that's where Pun came to see me that day. Because Pun used to come in there and shop too. Pun used to come in there and shop for the whole team. But when they all came in, I'll just walk outside. You know what I mean? You already know. You already know that Steph Curry was always on my hip. So I'll step outside. Because, you know, I don't, listen, man, it's a doggy dog world, bro. Your own man's will get you. You feel me? So I was just on point. But Melvin held me down. And the brothers that worked in there with me held me down. So when Pun gave me that money the year later, that's who I gave the money to. Dudes that helped me eat every day. Even Melvin, fucking millionaire, I gave him $100. So just show you what the money means to me, nothing. So you were working at the store at the same time as you were working at Terror Squad offices after the separation? Yeah. Yeah, in a sense, yep. And so during that time, did you guys have any interaction when you guys separated, you and Pun? Not, we'll see each other. We just look at each other in the eye. He won't say nothing to me. I won't say nothing to him. Until that, until that last time that, you know, I looked at him. I walked out the store. He walked out the store, got back in his, his cherry web for 150. Looked at me. I looked at him. He's my dog. And he fist bump. And I put my fist bump out. I put my fist bump out. He grabbed my hand. He gave me $1,000. And I was like, I ain't saying nothing, I ain't saying nothing, but right there, that said everything, you feel me? That's like a man telling you, yeah, you know, my nigga, I was wrong, nigga, but, and then, after that, you know, we spoke again, all his cars were, were under my name, you know, as my man, I, I'll do anything, you know, to, to help my man out, and to help myself out, you know what I mean? Like, he asked me, yo, can you put the car in your name? I'm gonna tell him no. Nah, dog. Oh, yeah, dog, your credit to your credit get right to you. Yeah, yeah, right, bro. Let's go. You can transfer it over anytime you want. All right. So then when they only got told, he called me. He was like, yo, dog, she's in the pound. Can you get him out? I'm the only one that can get him out. They under my name. <laughs> All right. So I did that. But like I said, dog, like I it's it's sad. But then again, it's a blessing, bro, because look, I know he's I know he's with me because I'm, you're interviewing me, you asking me questions about this whole situation. Uh, and what, what was the, the vibe like between you and the other terror squad members at that time? Because he, you know, you guys separated. Everything was still cool with everyone else though? Oh yeah, I'm cool. I was cool with everybody. I'm still kind of cool with everybody there. Um, these niggas don't talk to me because like I said, when that happened with Cuban, you know, I, I went on the side. One, that's Pun's man. Pun is not here. Pun is, is not here. So, but those are my mans. I'm, 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 I'm going to stay true to Pun. I'm going to stay true to Cuban. You know what I mean? Again. But I mean, like, at that time where, like, you and Pun had separated that. Oh, no, I was still working. I was still doing, I, I was still go to shows. I was still help Pun. I was still teach the dude that's help. The, the new dude that was with him, I was teach him what to do. So I started doing everything. I, I, I knew how to do it. Like, he didn't have to tell me, yo, put a chair over there, yo, twin. I need this, yo, twin. Like, I was already there. I was already doing shit, dog. Like, like I, 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 I ain't had nothing to know. I'm cool with everybody, like, in a sense. But, nah, they talked to me. But the whole Tever squad was mainly rappers and, like, four other dudes. Like, it, like, it was different. It wasn't, you know, it was, everybody was a rapper. So you got... You got Tony Sunshine, you got Prospect, you got Armageddon, you got Sage, you got Cuban, you got Pun, you got Fat Joe. Then you got uh, Macho, you got JB, you got Raul, you got Flex, and you got me. That was it. That's who traveled the first tour. You know, and then some people would come on, shout out to Showbiz. He would come on, Showbiz, well, digging in the crates, of course. You know what I mean? But that was who traveled with us. That was the first. And Booby the Boxer, Pun's cousin. That was who used to travel. That's who traveled with us for the first whole tour. That was the Tever Squad. But you rekindled the relationship like two weeks before his death. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the day um, 
yeah, the day after go take them right after my two weeks after my birthday was no, it was like a yeah, it was like um yeah, something like that. No, it was on my birthday when I did rekindle. I went to the studio, he was doing yeah baby. Um, because remember he died two years after my I mean two weeks after my birthday, so I'm January twenty fourth, the following week, and then February seventh was when he died. So January was my birthday, January twenty fourth, February seventh, he died. That January 24th, I went and I, he played a Yeah Baby album for me. That same night, he was going to take the album picture cover. He asked me to go with him. We talked that we kind of, you know, we straightened our shit out then in the studio. And um, and I took the picture with him with the Yeah Baby, The Last Supper. And then, you know, we were supposed to meet up. And February 7th was when he died. <clears throat> So when I interviewed Cuban, right, he said that Pun was the glue of Terror Squad. He held everything together. And um, with his death, do you think that because everybody grieves differently that they took their grief out on each other and that helped separate Terror Squad? Pun was the Pun was the gorilla glue and the crazy glue mixed together. <laughs> <laughs> My metaphors, right? So, of course, when you are new to something that's new to you, your reactions are a first time reaction. So you don't, you know, you don't know what's going through somebody's brain. Could be real total love. Could be total love for I lost my lot of money. It could be put the, the pointing of the finger game starts coming out start pointing fingers oh you would have did it like this and we would have did it like, you know what i mean so a lot of could have should have would have but um it definitely changed the pattern on the way things were actually going you know because then there was a lot of you know disagreements started coming along and a lot of pulling in different directions. I want to do this. No, we should do that. Um, you know, you're not thinking about me. You don't care about me. And all of that back for you're not real with me. You know, you know, so all of that goes back and forth to everybody. You know, so people don't actually know where they're standing at this point in time because there's no, there was never a conversation to say, all right, bro. <clears throat> Pun is gone, right? We hurt it, but what are we gonna do as a family? And what are we gonna do as a family business? Those conversations never came along as a collective group, right? So some are hoping that you know you you leave it in the in the in the hands of the leaders of what the plan is going to be moving here forward. But not everybody was a part of that conversation. So when the decisions were made on how it was going to move forward, you saw it more in action than in words. I feel like Joe gets a lot of flack, right, for, for this. Um, but from his words, like, I think a couple family members died around the same time as Pun, and he went into a big depression. And so, yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. And so that probably contributed to the separation where you're looking for leadership from the, the top dude, right? Of how are we going to move forward? What are we going to do now that Pun is gone? Do you remember what Joe's reaction was when Pun died? Nah, man, he was hurt. You know, I mean, he was hurt. That's his that's his protege. You feel me? Like he just didn't look at him totally like money music. He had love for him. He understood the stories that we understand, you know, the the, the trials and tribulations Pun went through. So, you know, obviously, you know, he helped Pun tremendously have a change of life. Vice versa, they both changed each other's lives. So I'm not, you know, I, 
I know he was bothered. And plus, he's had, like you said, he had other situations that happened, which, like I said, I was I was there for one of them. And I know that, that hurt him more than anything because that was his blood. You feel me? So, again, if we knew the time, you know, but we were we were young, bro. We was like, you know, we weren't even this, as educated as we are now. Like, even though we had education, but you know, you you know, you as you grow in life, you grow as a man, right? So you 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 know, then you have to go through your trials and and tribulations and stumbles to to grow and to become a man. So, like again, back then I would have been bitter. I would have been like, ah, but no, you have to understand. You got to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. You can't just always stay in your shoes. You think what I'm saying? Like you got to see what. All right, all right, you know. I get it, but if we were a family, then we could sit down together and say, Yo, bros, man, like that's what real dudes do. Like, <clears throat> like that's what I think real people do. Like they they bond. But that's just my belief. That's my thought, dog. Not everybody gonna think like me. I would have, I was there for niggas. I'm like, bro, I got I got an ear. I don't have to talk. I don't have to give you advice. I could just listen to you all night long and then just let you get it off your chest and you feel better about yourself. Cause you have your own answers. Right. And I think that you feel I me? think that everybody grieves differently, right? And somebody's intention isn't necessarily always the message that gets sent. Sometimes people perceive the message differently from what the person intends. So like if he's not being supportive or he's a little dismissive or something like that, that might not be what he's trying to do, but he's just going through the motions. He's going through his own thing. You know. Well, you got to look at it too, like, you know, he just lost a big part of his ship. Now he has to rebuild that. He has to fix that. You don't know if it's going to sink. And, 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 you know, you, I could have, but we were there to support that though. You dig what I'm saying? Like we were there to be like, all right, what do you, what, what do we got to do? Like, what do uh, uh, you know, the, the shit is, you know, you grab the anchor and you grab the, the bow and you grab the, the sail and you start, but then you got people, oh, leave that shit alone, Doug. And then some people want to see the demise. Some people want to see the change. Some people, you don't want unnecessary luggage around you if you have a plan already. You feel me? Your, the plan was already in motor, motion. And then, you know, obviously, you know, Joe's an entertainer as well right. so you know he had, he had to he had to go back and think about oh well i gotta keep this afloat you know i gotta come out and do music you know saying so people know me they really don't know these guys but through through me they could still know these guys that never happened do you think that if pun was still alive that joe would have just played more of the exec role instead of going to the forefront and really going with the music more like he has, I guess, over the years, like he, he might feel more obligated to do that. No, I think he would have continued this continuously. I've done his music because he's an artist. You know what I mean? He would have just had, he would have wore two hats, but he would have dropped the songs his singles, of course, because he got, he has a passion for music <clears throat> and he has a passion for production. You know, if you know him, he loves he loves music, right? So he has. So if he thinks of something, and he, he you know thinks of a topic, he'll do it. You know. And plus, that's a competition up there, dog. You know, everybody want to say they you know they they got the baddest rap. Everybody everybody want to slick talk. Rap is just slick talking. Did you know that? Did you know rap is just a slick talker? Dude's been rapping since the nineteen twenties, dog. It ain't just start. Definitely. So it's Angie Martinez album release party at Jimmy's in the Bronx, right? Sun Kiss, yeah. Fat Joe get into it. Why did they start fighting? I have no clue, man. I have no clue, dog. Because in the um, the interview with Doggy Diamonds, you seemed like confused by what was going on. Like you were watching it happen, right? But like you were like, "Why is this happening?" Correct. Cuban tries to break up the fight. But Joe starts hooking on Cuban then. And so Cuban fights back and he gets his face slashed. You're watching the whole incident take place. Now, we obviously not going to say who cut Cuban, but was it visible to you from where you were standing? I never even, I never even knew it happened, dog. I heard it happen like afterwards. like Because I would assume that Cuban would have asked you if you saw what happened, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, 
if if he would have, if, you know, if, remember if it was a, it was every man for himself after that. So, you know, I don't know if he's trusting me. I don't know, you know, he ain't going you know what I mean. But later on, he did, and I'm like, I don't know. I wish I knew. But again, what was your you know, that dude, What was your reaction when you were watching the whole thing happen? Like I'm looking at you now, dog. It was like the fuck happened here. Like fuck is going on here. So I guess through all the the build up of pun passing and people's ideas and conversations and arguments and you know a decision was made that night that I call it the changing of the guard. It was like y'all out, we in, we going this route, y'all go that route. So do you think that that was planned? We're not again. Um, uh, I, I mean, it happened, brother. So it was planned. <laughs> it happened. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, 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 if it happened, it was planned. So you know what I mean? Because people trying to break fights up. People wasn't trying to get hit with the fight. People trying to stop that first initial initial fight, and then then he swing at him. He swing back. They went over there fighting, rumbling into the corner. And I'm just there looking at it like, wow, this is an album release party. Every major player is up in here in the industry. It's the girl's album, first album. And this, this, this could have been taken care of somewhere else. Again, this could have been with us before we went there. Could have been taken care of before we all went there, like, so when you see that and you coming from the outside looking in, you're like, ain't they boys? Why are they fighting? Oh, one must have disrespected the other one. So. And how was uh, Angie Martinez reacting to all of this ha- happening at her album release party? I wouldn't know, but I ain't even see her there. That. I saw her one time on stage and I ain't never see her again since that night. So, I mean, you have to ask her how she feel. If she wants to answer it, right? Well, nobody, nobody want to talk about it because it's very sensitive. You know, knock on wood. Thank God, bro. Like, like nobody fell behind this sensitive beef. That's how the world see it. Like, yeah, that's their problem. You know, as much as everybody want to be in the business, but that's their problem. You feel me? So they could fix their problem. Just. It's not not about nothing. Like I, bro, listen. At the end of the day, I wasn't contracted under nobody. So, like, I'm not signed to nobody. I'm just there. So that that's on them, though. They want squash. They want squash it. They want to talk to me. They want to say hi. Or, yeah, they don't. No problem. No sweat on my back. Mm-hmm. You said something in the Doggy Diamonds interview. I found really interesting. You said that the tape got lost. So are you saying that the fight was recorded and then somehow it ended up missing? Well, you in a popular nightclub, I believe there's recording in there. Huh? Hmm. So, you know, but again, that's 23 years ago. You're talking 23 years ago. I got kids older than that right now, though. Ain't nobody think about that. Like, like I get it for views and for whatever, but nobody think about that, dog. You don't see the type of world we living in right now? We give a fuck about 23 old beef. These young kids right now don't give a fuck about that. They ain't talking about that shit. They don't give a fuck about that, dog. These young kids don't give a fuck who you were in the past. They don't care. It's daytime, so you got to give them daytime. That shit is old news, dog. If niggas want to ask me a question, I'll answer it. But I said, this is a conversation. Me and you just talking. Right. You know what I mean? Because you said that you saw the owner and he looked at you with guilt on his face, right? I feel like you interrogated me, Doug. (laughs) (laughs) So you said, I mean, bro, listen, man. It is what it is, bro. I said already in the sense of you, bro, like, and I said it before, things could have been handled different in that aspect. Pun would not be happy. Pun is not happy. That's why, you know, things are the way they are. But, you know, people are successful and we are successful in our major way. And, you know, God bless. God bless the brother that got it. Like, we good, bro. As long as you're healthy in life, that's all that matters. 
Gabby, you could be as rich as you want, but if you're sick, you ain't no good. Facts. You look at Steve I mean, Jobs, right? Yeah, right. So you could be physically or mentally sick in the head. It's all good, man. It's what I do now. I, I, I save lives, bro. I'm in these streets trying to talk to the little youngies and, and tell them, yo, bro, like, you know, there's more to life than just killing your own kind. So we do. <laughs> that's all we do in music and black music hip hop that's all we do we we do these interviews and we and we try our best to be as um influential as possible and some people take these interviews and they, they just pick one word out of it and they'll run with it but if you look at the way the world is right now doc like music is separating people it's separating people the dudes are killing each other just to get a bag and throw it in your face. Like put all them diamonds on your neck and then, you know, get killed in another state when you're supposed to be loved everywhere you go. There ain't no love right now in this game. And the ones that are in position that, that, have, a, that have a definitely uh, situation that can begin to change the narrative slowly but surely, they're not doing it. They capitalize on the on the violence and it and the, and the disconnect. Let's talk about that. Like I get all the pun, Cuban Joe. Listen, man, at the end of the day, man, I, I have love for those people every in different ways. You know what I mean? I can't tell you. I I, I hate. I, I don't that word hate. Don't exist in my life, bro. Understanding, misunderstanding. I'm learning that one. But right now, dumb people are all in position to say, we're going to have a hip hop summit. We're going to stop what's going on. We're going we're gonna to show the origin of hip hop, whether it started in the Bronx, New York, and, you know, every state knew it, had it, and, you know, the two corners control it. L.A., though, I'm, I'm an L.A. rapper fan my whole life. And East Coast, obviously, I'm here of origin. So, you know, but in between, you know, dudes are smoking on, on me. You know, it's, it's just sad. This whole rap situation is sad. So, Pun, God knew why he took Pun upstairs because Pun would have definitely said something crazy about all this shit. He'd have been disrespecting every fucking rap out here. Lyrically. You a deep dude, Gilly. I can tell, man. For sure. Appreciate that, Doug. That's why I tell you, me and you going to talk, Doug. Like, I'll, let, I, I'll give you what you want, what, what you want to hear if I got the answer to it. Feel me? I'm not going to duck and dodge shit, but certain things like, like when that shit happened to fight, I'm standing there. I, was, I see niggas swinging. I'm like, the fuck? The fuck? You don't know. Then when you when then when you try to fall around the corner and you be like, yo, bro, what we doing? It's like, nah, dog, we doing this, you doing that. Like, nah, get we'll, we'll catch up with you. So I'm like, oh, now the niggas is catching up with me, dog. <laughs> like, what the fuck did I, you know what I mean? So it's like that. My, my little man got cut. My other man's that I've been with since day one is telling me for the fuck back. All the two years later, in less than an hour you're telling me fall the fuck back and my little man is gone he cut I don't know what happened with their conversation but obviously I saw the result of that and I'm like damn that's fucked up and what you're talking about is basically after that incident that Joe and the record label they told you they don't want you around anymore right no, nah, but it was no record label. It was, it was, it was the, it was, it was the manager Flex. It was like I, re- I don't want to talk about him because I respect the dad. So let's leave him. You can, you know, it's the, you know, you just put the manager, like, you know what I mean. But you know, he was like, yo. So I was like, all right. But it wasn't that. It wasn't immediately after that happened. It was like that night. That night, it was already fall back. You know what I mean. But, you know, they still had, um, they still had some unattended business with me. 
Who uh who told you to fall back? Was that Joe? Nah. Nah. I already told you. And did you ever have a conversation with Joe about what happened with TS in the Cuban beef? No, nah, not at all. No, nah, I saw, I spoke to him one time. We was in I was in Miami with my family and um he called me on the phone. And he's like, I ain't got no problem with you. And I was like, I ain't got no problem with you. I guess it became a problem when he saw that I was hanging more close to the Cuban than with him. But he didn't want me around. And again, you know, my honor is to pun. Punish Cuban's man. Just mentioned him in every song he made. Proof is in the pudding. That's his man. This man first. Before they met the other side. You know what I mean? So what was your uh, immediate reaction when they told you that they didn't want you around anymore? Good money, Doug. I ain't asked no questions. Well, I'm like, cool. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a franchise player anyway, Doug. I, I, I roll by myself, man. I got, I got God. I got God with me. I got God, I got green, and I got gun. I'm good. Got the three G's. You know? I feel like with you losing pun on one hand, you know, I mean, that was one aspect of, like, the job and the, the financial side of things, but you also lost your friend. And he was my dog, man. He was, good. He, was, he was my dog, man. He was good, man. We, we understood each other, dog. I mean, he was my dog. I helped him, man. You know what I'm saying? I cared for him. You know, like he's my dog, bro. He, he couldn't do a lot of things with, with his weight, so I, I, I would help him. You know what I mean? You lost him as a friend, so you're mourning that. But then there's the bigger picture because you felt like we're doing this for our- I lost a couple of friends, bro. I lost a couple of people I thought were friends. I lost a dear one. I lost Cuban as a friend for a while. Definitely lost Joe as a friend. Uh, I don't speak to nobody else in the, in the camp. We can know about it, but I don't need no friends. You know what I mean? Like, I'm talking about childhood friends. Like, you know, we grown ups, you know, so it's not only I lost one friend, you know, we just lost, we lost something beautiful. You know, we lost something that was, that was one time and never happened again. As many as continue to try, a thousand puns have tried to get on. Ain't none of them get on. Niggas try to be fat like pun and spit like pun and, and then look like pun and it's only one of a kind. You know, like Cuban is only one of a kind. You know what I mean? You know, granted, Pitbull, you know, did it. And, um, you know, but that's Cuban style. Pitbull already was, he was, he was doing his homework. <laughs> Cuban, whatever, all that, and then shout out to him. He's super successful. And, you know, we've had a, a history with him, but he, um, he did his homework. And he knew how to put songs together like what Cuban was doing. Cuban was already doing that. But I feel like also you you kind of lost that purpose because it was so important to you to put on for Puerto Ricans and for the people and 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 you know that put on for hip hop put on for hip hop in New York. I just happen to be Puerto Rican, you know. But just put on for hip hop in New York, like what the origin, the birth of it, who created it, you know, the sounds, you know, yeah. I, I felt like I could have done more as a pioneer in hip hop, as a as a teacher of the music and what it stands for, what it stood for, and you know, and and help the pioneers like the Grandmaster Kaz, you know, like those the Brucey Bees, you know, the Busy Bees, the DJ Whip and Whips that nobody knows that those were the creators of hip hop. Yeah, Cool Herc threw the first party. The dudes before there was a first party, niggas was doing this shit outside. He just controlled it. Yeah, respect to him for controlling the party. But the party was already doing it. It was only DJs before it was MCs. It was only DJs. There was no MCs. The DJ was mixing, mixing, mixing music. Bro, all break beats. All the break beats that you've heard throughout your whole life. That shit was in park jams. Like that shit was like, you know. We didn't even know what we what, what we had. Like, it was, 
dope. That's why I still listen to my old grandmas, the Cavs, the Cold Crush Brothers, Furious Five, you know, Funky Four plus one more, Kumo D. Did you know that Grandmaster Cavs wrote the Sugar Hill Gang song? The uh, Rapper's Delight? Yeah. 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 I didn't even know that. So the other day I'm researching. And I'm looking, I'm like, oh, shit. And I'm with Kaz, and I'm, I'm with Kaz. Like, I'm, I chill with him from time to time. We always see each other in the summer. And it's like, wow, well, you don't even know who you're standing next to sometimes. Feel me? Facts. But, 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 but they talk to you like the way me and you was talking. Like, it's just like regular shit. But, you know, they didn't get, they, they just do. So why would I sit here and cry about my little shit when them dudes, they ain't getting nothing? Yeah, definitely. How do you feel about the narrative that uh, Puerto Ricans and Blacks created hip-hop together 50-50? Do you think that's accurate? We were there. We were there like, yeah, but you know what? Um, everybody played their part. Everybody played their part. Whether it's, you know, the, the fashion, the look, the talk, you know, um, yeah. Deep. But do you think it's 50-50? I mean, how else could it be? 60 40, 60 40, 80 20, 90 10. Nah. Nah. 50 50, bro. We were there. If me and you walk in the club, if, if, if me and you walk in the club, right? We 50 50. It's me and you. I had a friend one time, a rapper kid. He wanted to go to this rap battle. No lie. He had no money in his pocket. I only had a dollar in my pocket. Right? He said, yo, Gil, come on, call me. He said, I ain't got no money. He said, don't worry about it. We got a ride going. We got a ride coming back. Call me. I said, I said, I said, call me the store. I took the dollar. I told the man in the store, give me four quarters. I took the four quarters. I gave him 50 cents, and I stood with 50 cents. And I said, the same way we're going to get in this car and go over together, we're going to come back and we're going to come back to the block together. That's 50-50. He went to rap. I went to hold him down. That's not 50-50. I feel you on that. I feel like, but you know, it's crazy because people get so mad about this conversation. When but people, because people don't know, because people don't know, because people, you know, every people just want everybody, everybody wants to say it was me, it was me, it was we. God in the Bible says you are made in our image. It was a we. Then He says you're made in my image, but at first you was made in ours. So there's somebody, there's other people there. God not alone. Right. God is not even alone, duh. Stands alone, but he's not alone. A man stands alone, but he's not alone. It makes sense. Definitely. Yeah, because when I interviewed... Is this the type of interview you was looking for, Pops? <laughs> no. Um, when I interviewed... This shit ain't gonna get you... This shit ain't gonna get you no views, dog. Why'd you even waste your time? <laughs> no, I don't say that. I love you, though. I love you, though, Panda. Now nah, I want you to pop, my dude. Maybe not with me, but somebody else. I hope you. you're a good dude. You seem like you got good spirit. Appreciate you, bro. Yeah, when I uh, interviewed Charlie Rock, and he was saying that it was 50-50 because he, he saw it happen, you know, and people got upset. We all did. I used to carry the crates for for, for Africa Bambada, bro. Come on. I used to I used to go to the store for Grandmaster Kaz and them, bro. We was there. We was in the jams. The Mighty Gestapo, the Zulu Nation. The mighty Gestapo, bro. Nobody talk about the mighty Gestapo and the Zulu. Everybody talk about Zulu, but mighty Gestapo, bro. There was black Puerto Ricans. Puerto Ricans are black anyway. Puerto Ricans have African culture. Like, come on, like, stop. Bro, we come from there too. Stop. And we have European blood from the conqueror. I said that. Like, come on, bro. Like, bro, Puerto Ricans is black, bro. So whatever black man does not understand, but he can have an aunt from, from St. Thomas and St. Croix. That's just around Puerto Rico. Yeah. Come on, bro. Jamaica, like Cuba, like, bro, like, come on, bro. Brazil, like, bro, listen, we all have, we all got black in us now. Some people want to, some of us are lighter than others because some of us favor our European uh, blood conqueror. 
Come on, man. Like, everybody got time for that's ignorance, but we need to educate our people. Bro, we need we our people are so lost and dumb, and I don't blame them because they're not trying to think about 400 years ago. They're trying to think about 400 years from now. And that's what I think. I don't want to keep talking about what happened 400 years ago, my ancestors. Like, we already know what happened. What are we doing about it? Nothing. We oppressing the same, we're doing the same oppression to our own kind, what was done to us, because it's already in our brain. And that's a that's a good point, because if you look at it like in the music industry alone, right, you signed a terrible contract that was done by the oppressor, right? And then you turn around and you give that same contract to your brother. And it's a vicious cycle. Not with everybody. That's why you got to look at 50 Cent. You got to look at the way Eminem, Fifth, and, and Dre and them did it. They all look good. Look, even today, the other day, I was watching another interview with Scarface and Willie, Mo, Willie, Willie D and them. He went to the Grammys and he didn't take his crew with him. I would feel some type of way. And you sing it out song, and you sing it out song, like, bro, at least tell them niggas, yo, fly my crew in, make sure they good, put them up in the penthouse as well as me. It's, it's all good. You know why? Because the record label, they, they give you this, this this great deal, and they'll give you an advance, but they don't tell you at the fine print that it's recoupable. Right. So they'll give you, they'll give you, they'll give you a million dollars, but it's recoupable. You owe them a mil. Then you go get limos, you got fought. Now it's different. Now you you ordering planes. That shit come out your budget. Some people make so much money it doesn't bother their budget. But you know, you know also the way that they bill certain things, it's not uh it's not one hundred percent correct, right? I mean, you've seen it happen. You don't read the fine print. You got to read the fine print. Like with the like with the 360 deal. There's nothing wrong with a 360 deal. If, if there's an advance with a non-recoupable situation on top of that, of course, it's a great situation because you own 50% of everything I do. So I need $5 million up front because you, you're about you about to get $50 million and non-recoupable because you're about to get a hell of money. Record labels make, you know, $40, 50000000 million off of one album. You only get two dollars at the time an album or a dollar an album you made one dollar you made one million two million dollars they made 30 40 million damn and they only invested a half a mil but everything else that come out wardrobe you know traveling hotel your team your entourage your 10 bedroom 10 hotel rooms on a tour that shit costs yeah that shit costs so you know it's a, you know you, you it's but there's not there's not a union in it where, you know, if you've been a, a successful rapper for over 10, 15 years, like in the NBA and in sports, you know, they're they good. They got a union. You know, they, they'll receive benefits. They won't be broke, you know, once they when they reach that, that age that you're out of the light because now hip-hop, you can't be a 30, 40-year-old rapper right now. You can't. Not unless you have a... A, a a a song that's a that's a universal hit, right? You know, like Two Chains. Two Chains. He was older when he finally got a situation because he had that hot. He had that hot shit, undeniable. But you know, like also like how you were saying before with uh, like the rappers that came before, right? The ones that helped laid the groundwork. Hip hop wasn't as profitable as it is now, right? And so a lot of times people look at the ones that came before as you guys were dumb, you guys didn't know better, you guys didn't do better and all that stuff. But they helped lay the groundwork for you to even be in the position that you are now to make the kind of money that you have now. So it's kind of disrespectful the way that people talk about things in that way. And like you said, there's no union, there's no retirement fund, there's no... People don't think of that. People are not thinking that right now, right? This is a conversation. See, nobody want to talk to me about this because this is where my thought is at in hip hop, bro. Like I seen it born. Like you got look the rappers that 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 you mentioned from the past. 
bro, people have used their words. People have used their things to continue to today. You can hear beats from the 70s and 80s, little loops in it and all that. It's today. So there's, there's, no, there's, your, there's no unification of our people, all our people, because hip hop is a universal uh, uh, genre. Yeah. Right? Which is all music because we all like, I love country music. Don't get it twisted. I like my country music. Do I listen to all of it? No, but there's certain songs that I listen to it. And, you know, they know how to bounce around like Lil Nas X did the country song with, with this dude. You know what I mean? I don't know, dog. I just, I, I just look at this shit like, what's the worth? You got rappers. You have a, you have a rapper. You have a couple of rappers that are billionaires, right? So if they're billionaires, the people that put them on are what? They ain't millionaires. They ain't millionaires. So you mean to tell me between all of that extra money that's running around? There's not a union. There's not something to give Rakim. Take care of Rakim. Granddaddy Ayu, got rest the soul, just died. They automatically should have paid for his funeral. The hip hop community does not stick together. It's a competitive sport. It's more competitive than MMA. Right? It's gladiator stuff. But there should be some type of respect for a, a gladiator, a person that performed and caught his scars and bumps along the way. And when he when he sets retirement, because he survived it, look at Rakim. Look at Karis One. They're in their late 50s, and they're so fluent. There's no union for them. You give them a museum, and that's how you butter them up. But you see, like, in other genres, right, people that are older that have been able to progress and make hits for, or, like, you know, have a long career, they're still respected in the, uh, in the other genres. In hip-hop, it's such a young man's game where, like, the new, jo- uh, the new people are like, fuck who came before me. I don't care. You know what I mean? Y'all old. Y'all dusty. We don't give a shit about that. And that's the problem, though. Well, that's because the people that sign their checks are the old and dusty ones. You see what I'm saying? So that's that's that that's a, a hypocritical statement because those same old dusty niggas are signing your contract, so they can't be old and dusty because they're the ones moving the machine. Right? But when you put in the mentality that a nigga old and dusty of course, everybody gonna believe it. I'm not old and dusty. I'm older. <laughs> Feel me? I'm older, and you're gonna get older every day. When you old, you're in the attic, bro, getting cobwebs. Like you don't, you're a hermit. You don't move out your house, you know. But you're older. You obviously you're supposed to be older. You're supposed to. The, the, the goal of life is to become older and come become wiser and and and, and make you know. You, you know, make your mark in society and, and whatever way you do. But you know, the, the interesting thing is that because hip hop is still a younger genre when you compare it to the other genres, right? Like we, in more recent years, we've been able to finally see artists live long enough to be able to reach this stage in their lives. And it, it's cool that you get to see KRS one at 50 years old or, you know, like all these different things. And it's like, why wouldn't you, want to commend people to be living that long to be moving on to their different parts of their lives like don't you aspire to one day reach that point well because the message the message of the hip hop in in our day is a different message you can't really blame these young rappers either in the sense that they are only rapping what they see and do right rap is what you see and do so we grew up with fancy cars, jewelry, women, you know. Um, then it became, you know, niggas ain't shit but hoes and trick or bitches ain't shit. Now we, you know, we emphasize the bitch word. Now to the point where these kids nowadays, they they only focus on the lean, the the Xanax, the the the, the the woman is a bitch, 
heavier now. I hear rappers, so yo, that's my bitch. Yeah, yeah, me and my bitch. I'm like, you know, um, you know, and 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 gunplay and oppression. Like the, these kids in the south, they grew up seeing that. They that's what they you going to rap about what you grew up seeing. You know, we might could talk about you know the Bentley and all that, but you're not going to rap about what you don't got. It's a dream, but when you do got it. Now you're rapping about the Bentley, the, the jet planes, the private planes. You know what I mean? But to be fair, some rappers did rap about it before getting it, though. It was almost as a way to, like, speak it into existence, though. Correct. I was about to say that. Yep. I agree. I agree. You got to speak it into existence. So what they're speaking into existence right now is murder. Because, man, look at the great, these little great rappers that were coming up. They didn't even get a chance, bro. They, they, I, I don't, I don't know most of their names, but there's a couple of them that I heard the songs. I'm like, oh word, that was him, you know what I mean? I'm like, damn, they didn't even get a shot because, you know, they speak violence into their existence. Their life, everyday life, is violence. Like they, they, you know, it's about destruction. It's about, you know, one is doggy dog, bro. It's like the only way I could get on is if I kill Panda. It's, you know, the mentality, I feel like it's a live fast and die young mentality. Well, that's what it was trained to be. It was it was a 50 year plan. 50 years ago was to get the black and brown man to be what we are to today and all society. It, it was a plan. It's working. It's in existence. You know, the house was broken. The majority of the men went to jail. The women had to fend for themselves. Do our jobs, do circumstantial jobs, um, like become strippers to feed their family. You know, back in the days, there was no strippers. It was called go 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 clubs. You go to the go go club. There's a grown women up in there. Now you got 19 year old girls. As soon as they get their little pretty body and they got the fit, they running up in the club just to let do throw money and touch them. That's not that's not that's not what it's meant for. And then people can say, oh, but that's how the world goes. Nah, bro, that's how y'all want the world to go. You know, but money control the world. So you got to do what money want. So if you want what money, or you want money, you got to do what money want right now. How is uh, your relationship with Liza, Hun's wife? I haven't spoken to her in a while. Um, last left off, we cool. I just haven't spoken to her in a while. Hope she's well wherever she is. Do you ever think things between her and Joel will ever be fixed? I have no clue. Did you ever have a, a conversation with either about resolving things or what the real problem is? No, I haven't spoken with Joel in the 23 years. And Liza, I haven't spoken to Liza. Only saw her at the pun block naming and just said hello and gave a hug and that was about it. You know, uh, no conversation. And and where do you stand on uh what has been said on either side as far as like Joe saying, I gave you money out of my own pocket, big pun never recouped. That shit, I don't know, though. That's way over my head. Man, that's way over my head. I know Punch sold, first album sold 2 million copies, and I don't know what the other one sold, but whether he gave him money or not, that's between them. I ain't getting son of it, so it ain't mean none of my business. And you've uh, you've been on record, and you said that you saw with your own eyes Big Pun and Triple Sis uh, writing for Joe, right? Do you Did you ever see Cuban and Armageddon writing for Joe? It's not like they sat there and like he stood there and did nothing and they were just writing for him. No, dudes was just writing, writing, just writing rhymes and you know what I'm saying? And be like, yo, use that, use this. It's not like they sat there and he was like, yo, write me a song to this beat. You know, dudes is just writing rhymes. They got books, they got rhyme books. So, yo, use that, use this. They all, it's like, yo, use that. Yeah, don't worry about it. It's us. Doesn't, it, you know, it's us. 
So it was a it was a collaborative group effort. Yeah. 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 From what I saw. Why do you think uh Joe denies ever having a ghostwriter, especially in today's era, where it's like more acceptable for you to to receive help? Again, you have to ask him that, bro, because you just answered the question. You just said it's so you just have you have to ask him that. So with the the allegations of Big Pun writing for Joe, um, that means that his name should have been on the credit somewhat and he should have gotten paid for that. But yeah. as far as we know, he never did. Yeah, well, well no, well, not even you know, Sace is trying to get his ass cap and stuff like that and so is Cuban. Their names ain't on nothing. Mm. So Cuban got some money up in there. Do you think that that is part of kind of what Liza w- was talking about, like where she felt that like they didn't get their just due as far as financially? I don't recall hearing Liza say that, but if that's what she said, then... um I don't know if she said that specifically, but I feel like she would know more of like the work that that pun had put in. Yeah, but I don't know, Doug, because I, again, I wasn't I, I wasn't under contract with nobody there. I just worked. You know what I mean? I came through and I, I lent a helping hand. So you said you could say I volunteered, volunteered with a stipend. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Volunteer with a stipend. Do you personally feel like uh, Cuban has been blackballed from the industry? Because a lot of people say they don't think that he has. Of course he has. And do you think that's like Joe personally telling people don't work with this man? Or do you think that people see, yo, Cuban has an issue with someone that is powerful and we rather side with the uh, the larger artists just in case opportunities uh, come up? Yeah, well, I mean, again, you answered the question right there. I mean, basically, it's a little bit of both. You know, some people have to make a decision and a choice. And... um you know, you can see it. I mean, Cuban has tried to enter the rap game in different angles. He came in with a whole Spanish album and with Don Omar and Zion and Lennox. And it just took, it took, it took flight. And then all of a sudden, a radio don't play it. A radio will play, like if he did a collab with, with Jada Kiss, they'll play Jada Kiss's verse, but they won't play his. They'll play the song. They'll play Jada Kiss's verse, but they won't play his. Or they'll play games first, they won't play his. So, yeah. Yeah. What do you think about Cuban's career and the backlash he's received about doing interviews over the years trying to expose Joe? People feel like he's he's been stuck and that he should have he should have stopped doing those type of interviews. Well, because people keep asking him those same questions. They keep asking him the same old, same old questions. So, you know, it's like he's, he, you know, all of a sudden it turns something on where he has he has to relive all of it all over again. So they, they you know, of course he has a lot of good music. Um, I wish he would put out his music more. And, you know, but it's, it's hard because... It's time consuming. Um, it's, it's the internet. There's no way if you're gonna make money off of it. You just gotta throw it up, and if you get a million clicks or twenty million views, then you know, I, internet will probably send you a five hundred dollar check. You know, you, you can't sell songs no more. You know. Yeah, because people feel like you know, with the internet, that you can't be blackballed now. But I don't think that that's necessarily fully true. Of course. Of course, I guess. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I like, I don't know how this, you know, like, like, again, I don't know how you would, you, you would make money on your own. You have to get spins and, and views and IG and, 
maybe if you're on whatever the Apple Music and you sell your song for fifty cents or a dollar, you know that's. I mean, he has fans, but you have to come out. You know, with, with with good music, and he has good music. He has a lot of good music. Just has to try to do what what Joe has done. Just ignore the fact and just do music. But you know, the support system, the DJs aren't going to play it. The you know the DJs aren't going to play it and stuff like that. So you've heard a lot of his music that he hasn't released. Yeah, he has this one song. He has this one song that he did with his son. Uh, It's about Cuba. And I guarantee you, if he drops that song right now, that shit is a fucking universal hit. Wow. That shit's a fucking universal hit. And if he watches this, he's going to know. He drops that song right there, that song for Cuba, and and, and he shoots the video right, it's the passion and and along on a song. You know? Yeah, because he just uh he released Undeniable recently, right? And um I think he's working on his uh his album, The Missing Link, that's supposed to come out probably like in the summer or so. Um I feel like people keep on saying, Oh, you should release your music, you should release your music, but even when he does, he doesn't get the amount of same amount of attention versus like the drama of like doing the interview and talking about the Joe situation. You know, people don't really Pay attention to it. Because all people want to care about is the drama. Right. You know, he's super lyrical. Cuban is a dope artist, bro. Like, again. But it's hard now. Like you said, like, you know, he has to have that one universal song right now that pops. You know? And I know that that, that Cuban song. Like you were saying, though, like, because, you know, rap is like a young man sport, right? So... It's uh, it's tough to be at this stage of your career, you know, and I think that it's a it's a shame because like that 24K album, it never got that proper release. That album had some smashes on it for sure, you know, and I think that it's the whole album, the whole album would have been platinum. It would have been like shit would have still been selling till today, even more so. Because you remember, they, remember, they were ahead of their time, bro. Pun was ahead of his time. Yeah. Cuban was out of the time. Pun and Cuban and Sace always wrote together. Like, they came in together. They came in together before Tevin Squad. They were full Eclipse. Before that, there was, remember, Sace's name was Joker Jam. Cuban Link name was the Lyrical Assassin. So, you know, they've been had music. Pun's first album was already been, like all rappers do. They just put the shit on the album form. So have you spoken to Cuban in, in recent years about a plan to, to release the music or? I tell him all the time. I, I tell him all the time. Um, Cuban's my brother, man. I, you know, I love him. You know, he has a, he, he has a new management team around him and, you know, I, I wish them all the success and he's my brother. Um, you know, it's my dog. And, um, you know, but I don't, I don't, I don't work in music no more. I'm, I work in saving lives. You know, it's my program right here, Guns Down, Life Up. That's what I promote. I promote Guns Down, Life Up. Yeah, and uh, i definitely seen you've been doing some real big things out here, man. I commend you on that. It's, uh, it's amazing work, for sure. Well, God does that, Doug. You know, if you're a true servant of the Lord, he'll show you everything, and then he'll take it away from you, and then, you know, he, then you got to do your job. He'll give you a, 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 a vacation first, they help put you to work because the work never stops. And you haven't done many interviews. Um, why have so, haven't you spoken about these things more? Nobody called me, and who cares? I'll be with the little muddies, man, all day, man, with the young boys, man. You boys ain't think about old nigga shit, duh. You boys out here doing them. I'm trying to convince them to just do music and and don't be talking gang and jail and and killing niggas on your song because you're going to wind up in an indictment. As we can see with Young, we, we, as we can see with young Thugger, kid was fucking super talented, incredibly gifted. Everybody turned on him. 
No, he's he, everything YSL was a game. So that's the that's that's the path. That's the trail. But we say we gang and we gang gang and all the most of these rappers ain't. They mans. They block. Most of these rappers are goody two shoe kids, right? You know? The only real rap only real rapper I ever see bust a gun was Tupac, my dude. <laughs> That's it. And the only real rapper that ever bust a gun, my nigga, was Tupac, my nigga. He busted at the police, my nigga. Come on, let's keep it real, dog. Did you did you know uh, Young Thug from being in the industry? I didn't know him from the industry. I have a, a friend that uh, has a, a light relationship with him, and um, we came across each other's paths on the conversation one day. Let's just say that. Gotcha. But respect to him, man. You know, like, everybody got some type of good in them, man. It's the industry that eats you alive, bro. Make you be somebody you're not. Look at, look at all these other little rappers. These little dudes are pill heads. Dudes, they, just, they ain't even know. They, most of them, they, they ain't even know. They high on pills all day. They high on lean all day. I don't know what's going on around them. What did you think of uh, Nori saying that he would never interview Cuban because of his relationship with Joe? He told you how he really felt. He told you that his relationship, he's not going to want to hurt it with Joe. And, you know, he didn't, he, he just showed where his loyalty is, which he just told you. So it had to come out. The truth is going to come out. You can hold the truth forever, but that shit going to come out. It's got to come out through your pores. You can't hold it inside. You can't hold something that if you're not free with your heart and, and you have bitterness and you have strifes in your heart, it's going to expose itself because you can't harbor that. You have to, yeah, you, you have to let it out. You know, your stress will build up and it'll pop your heart. So you have to release the valve. Yeah, what they say is uh, what you resist will persist, right? Right. Yeah. And so I felt like with Nori, from a friend perspective, he definitely is doing the right thing, right? From a street code perspective, like if you got beef with my man, then, then you know, I can't be cool with you. But I think the problem is that people view him as a journalist because he's proclaimed himself to be a journalist. And if you're going to be on a platform asking Joe about Cuban, allowing Joe to tell his side about the Cuban situation, then as a journalist, you have to get the other side of things. And I think that that's where the problem was for a lot of people. Right. But, but you also got to understand that if, if you, I, I know a lot of dudes in the streets that, are a very big influence and there's been some beefs in the streets that certain dudes in position could be like let's sit down and talk that's what makes you a real dawn you sit down and you talk about your situations right and nori by being a, a media journalist um It should be cut. It should come a day where you know you got to close things out. It's open. It's it's been open for twenty three years. It's open. When do you put it to a closure? It's it's out of closure because everybody plays their own corner. But remember, Cuban's ambition was to do music. His ambition is not to work nowhere else. His skill, his gift is music. So why would he be denied that? Barbara Walters interview Fidel Castro. He was so anti-American, but she interviewed him. Osama bin Laden got interviewed by an American journalist. So you gotta you gotta look at the definition of what you consider yourself a journalist or not. Right. And I feel like, you know, because you say loyalty, of course, I could be loyal to my friend, but if I know this kid is a higher, he don't mean no harm, or he just trying to, like, and he expresses that, explain that to me, or whatever, or just say, yo, bro, like, let's just meet you and him talk, you know what I'm saying, so me and him could talk. See, the thing is that them Cuban and Joe need to sit down, everybody else need to just sit down and 
and just grab a seat and mind their business. That between them two men, one is wants to approach it one way, one doesn't want to approach it, you know, because it's irrelevant to him. But to one is relevant. What we'll tell the one is irrelevant. So how do you bring some type of relevance to the situation? Right? So them two men got to sit down, but everybody else is minding their business. Is anybody else in their business? Oh, I won't do it. Like even, even with Matt Hoffa, he said he won't do it either. Well, because you're on the next, you're the next one up with the biggest uh, podcast coming out. Got a great podcast. Yeah. But again, I get what Matt is saying. It's really nobody's business, but Joe and Cubans. You know what I mean? That's that's whose business this is. Just people, you know, made sure both sides were good. You know, I, if, if it wasn't for about the money for me, it's about the honor. You know what I mean? If it was about the money, I probably would have made a different decision, different choice. I've been labeled to sell out, been labeled all of this with all of that. But I, I stand for, for truth. I stand for myself. But I stand for truth. Ain't nobody, ain't nobody gonna hold me down. Though. Ain't nobody gonna protect me. Who gonna protect me? And I, I feel like with the the Nori situation, it's kind of like if you don't want to interview a Cuban, that's cool. But just don't bring him up on the platform. Then correct, correct, correct. And then you know what's crazy too? That DJ EFN, which is Cuban, which has DJed for Cuban. And which is a good friend of Cubans, but he can't be because he can't lose his spot. But he always tries to advocate for Cuban and they shut him down. So he has to eat it. Right? But EFN has always tried to mediate the situation. But he's not going to lose his job, so he got to stay shut out of it. You see his face when they mention Cuban name. You see EFN's face turns because it hurts because it's in the blood. It's, it's the blood of truth. Like, Cuban ain't do nothing wrong, though. What he did wrong? What he did wrong? He ain't do nothing wrong. Just try to get on. He's trying to do music. <laughs> You've seen Nori and EFN has brought up Cuban, like, in every single Fat Joe interview they've had pretty much on Drink Chat. Because EFN, because EFN be wanting to try to squash shit, dog. EFN used to DJ for Cuban Link. Come on, if Cuban Link was Cuban Link, who you think would be his DJ right now? Who you think would have been his DJ all these years of that? He would have been touring and doing super shows. Right. It would have been EFN. It would have been EFN. That was his man. Cuban got love for that kid. They Cuban. They Cuban. Cuban love his own kind. There ain't, there ain't too many Cubans in, uh, in New York like that. They're all in Miami. Yeah. And um, so Cuban is alone up here in New York. But there's Cubans up here. And when... Um... When Joe heard uh, EFN say like that EFN had uh, DJed for Cuban when no one wanted to, he was saying like, yo, we chased every single DJ that ever tried to DJ for Cuban and, and all that. That's when he had brought up that situation. All right. All right. All right. All right. So a logical mind is saying without the DJ, no music is going to be played. So if I beat up the DJ and I chase the DJ, they will never they'll be so afraid to put this man's music on. Is that not a form of black bull? Right. That's a fact. It's logical, bro. But it is what it is, bro. Listen, niggas is in their 50s already, dog. You know, Joe, you know, he, he did his thing. He took care of himself, and he is who he is. And my hope and dream is that Cuban gets to drop that one song because he has it. And he has it in him. That's a universal song. You could be 80 years old and niggas is going to jack it. And he has it. So my thing is for him to, to drop drop that song. You know, battle, battling, getting that niggas. Come on, he got like four mixtapes we did, bro. Just fucking shitting on everybody, bro. And we was about that. We was about that. You know what I mean? Niggas was like, yeah, fuck it. Like, it is what it is. That's how we felt then. You know? Why do you, why do you think that he hasn't released that song? I have no clue. It's a hit because it got to be done right. It's a hit. It's a hit. I tell him to play it for you. I tell him to play the Cuba Libre song for you. Cuba Libre, Free Cuba. Oh my God. When you put a Mark, you put you put a Mark Anthony on that song, is is just fuck it. It's over with. It's over. 
You put the Mark Anthony on it, but his son sings it, and his son sings it beautifully. The Cuban son sings it beautifully, though. But, you know, if you wanted to go to out the water like a whale jumping out the water, you put a Mark Anthony on that song. So people feel like you made the wrong decision siding with Cuban, right? Uh, but you made the decision based off of what is right and not what will benefit you more. Because a lot of people, they do it the opposite way. They're looking at the bag. They're looking at who can I benefit from more. But I think in the end, that decision haunts them because they had to look in the mirror at the end of the day. So you said that I'm haunted? No, I'm saying, but you made the decision. I don't even look, I don't even look, bro, I don't even look in the mirror, bro. How's that? (laughs) No, I'm saying that you made the right decision. You made a decision that you can live. No, I get what you're saying. No, no, I get what you're saying, dog. Yeah, well, decision that I made. I know that I can walk with my head up high past anybody. And um, they got to know why I made my decision. They know. I, I don't, I, I can walk with my head up high right now. And and that's what that matters to me, that I don't walk with shame. People walk with shame and they hide it under the makeup and the glasses and the eyelashes, and the long eyelashes so you can't really see in their eye. The eye is the, the the eye is the doorway to the brain. Yeah, they, they say it's the the windows to your soul, right? Yeah. Okay. And I I feel like um because in this industry, right, like so many people compromise themselves just to be able to make it. You know, they they uh do things that you hear what Nori you hear what Nori said. He said he was almost at the front door. <laughs> He was almost at the front door. Woo, 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 woo. You, you hear when he said that? Mm-mm. When he say that? Uh, oh, you never know he's saying in his interviews that, you know, he was approached to pass the door. Oh, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw that. Oh, okay. Okay. But in his uh, most recent interview with Math, right, he did say, he said, I was ready to sell out. You heard that? Yeah, he said that. Admit admittance. I was ready to sell out. Come on, bro. But that shit ain't in our vocabulary around here, homie. It's not. Sell out. Ah, nigga, nigga, you buy yourself on that one. That means you do anything. You put a dick in your ass. Yeah, because, you know, on the the Pistol Pete podcast, Nori said that the reason why Cuban cannot be on the podcast is because Joe owns Drink Champs with them. Newsflash. I don't think anybody knew that. It came out like a year and a half ago, right? And so then I did a clip about it and people were like, that's not true. He just said that. He don't really mean that. And I'm like, well, why would he say that if it's not true, though? You know, and then people acting like they know more than Nori does about his own situation. That's what's crazy. Yeah, all right, bro. Listen, man, I, I, I don't even know. I think I live life wrong, bro. I, I think I live life total. I think they all live life right, and I live it wrong. What makes you say that? Because how people are going to say he said it out of his mouth, and people are going to doubt it. Oh, he just said like that's like that like that like me being with a bad bitch, right? And you look at me and you be like, "Yo, Gil, you hit that?" And I really didn't, and I'll be like, "Nah, dog." You be like, "Yeah, yeah, right." You ain't gonna tell me, <laughs> right? Right. Or if I did, you are gonna be like, "Yeah, right." You know, you ain't hit that yet. You, you know what I'm saying? It don't matter what you say. You you wrong because everybody has their own opinion, and it's okay. It's okay. Fine. If that's what you want to believe, that's what you believe. The, the nigga told you in his face, right? Do I have to rewind it and play it for you? Nah, but he didn't mean that, though. I hate when people say that. Nah, but what I meant to say was, no, nigga, you said it. Biggie said it. If you said it, you meant it. You said it, you meant it. Bite my tongue for no one. Call me evil or unbelievable. Biggie said it. It's, it's funny because they, they was like, no, nah, he was just being sarcastic. He was just saying that. And I was like, bro, like, what are you talking about? And they're like, this was a clickbait video. I'm like, 
how is it clickbait if the man literally said that Joe owns it with them? Like, <laughs> I don't know how you can be more clear. Yeah, well. I'm different, dog. Like I said, the rap game, that shit was just a chapter, bro. Like, I played it. That shit came into my life, and I took it. I took the opportunity, and I learned from it, and I did what I had to do with it. I never asked to be in it. I never asked to be out of it. And mind you, after that, like, a whole bunch of, like, years later, I wound up, I wound up managing DMX, going to Europe with him. I didn't even know him. But I knew of him, of course. Everybody knows him, but I didn't know him. Like, I was like, yo, in the game, I was minding my business doing working and my man was like y'all need you to help me manage your artist i'm like who he's like he didn't even tell me i had to go to radio city music hall and see who it was i had to go to the show and when i went to the show it was dmx and then i built a similar relationship with dmx like i did with pun again history the shit that you know the shit brothers niggas go through and i wanted to going to Europe with him for three years. So I, I, I was so blessed to, to be able to manage and be a brother to, to one, two of the greatest rappers of, that ever lived. And one showed me the whole United States, which was pun, and obviously Joe Cuban and everybody. But then DMX took me around the world. And I think that was pun, you know, blessed me and let me see the world because I was such a great role manager to him and a great person to him that I had to help another one. And I helped him until I couldn't help him no more. I had another fallout. This man was giving him that shit in front of me. I punched his man in his face. They don't do that shit on my watch. He he was giving him that Your crack brother? in front of you and you didn't want to see him doing it? Uh, we don't, I ain't going to say it specifically. He didn't get that shit in front of me, Ma. I wasn't having it, B. That's it. That's it. And the niggas, and the niggas, you know, hated on my name. And once I got out of there, the first week I left there, the next week he he overdosed and he lived. Then I was gone for all of this time, and then he overdosed again and he died. But when he was with me, he was good. And he wasn't doing none of that shit in Europe, nigga. I had that nigga like a horse. I had that nigga back. I, I did Coachella with eggs, bro. I took him, me and him by ourselves. Me and him by ourselves. There was nobody, just me and him. Dude called me, uh, DJ Snake. You know DJ Snake? Yeah. DJ Snake called me like, yo, I want him to come. I just need him to do 45 seconds or 90 seconds. I said, I said, I actually want to go to Coachella for 90 seconds. How much you getting me, Doug? I said, I got you. I got you 20. He said, what? For 90 seconds? He said, how the fuck you did? I said, yo, you want to go? Yeah. Went. Flew in, drove from the LAX all the way to Coachella because there was no flights going into Coachella. We got there right on time. We got there right on time, right when he was getting on stage, getting dressed. And he came out and he did the, the, the set with DJ Snake. The fucking crowd went bananas. I was like, wow, I was at all. And it was just experiences. But shit that's priceless, bro. Shit that like, bro, and I ain't, I work it. I just work in the regular nine to five. God, God is beautiful, man. I give him all the glory, bro. All the glory, because who can say that they managed all of that? Who can say they've been around all that? Everything that we've been talking about. Right. Psst, incredible. So what was uh DMX like? If you could how could you best describe him as a person? I describe him like this. DMX the superhero, Earl Simmons the mild mannered. I knew both. I knew both. I wasn't, I, I was a fan of DMX, but I was more of a fan of Earl Simmons. Yeah. And you, you hear these stories of like how humble X was. Like he would stop and just talk to a homeless person just forever. And like, that's like, uh, we used to stop, we used to stop the car, see homeless people. We go to McDonald's and buy everybody McDonald's, sit down right there on the grass with them and eat with them. In Europe, you see a bride walking down and she's about to get married. That nigga used to just go in the in the pouch and just give her like mad euros. And I used to be like, yo, ex, like, ah, fucking dog. I'm like, yo, bro, like, we got to break down hundreds, my nigga. And you could give people 20, 40, 60 dollars. He was giving people stacks of hundreds. He was sweet with us, man. He was a good man. Uh, yeah. But then when he turned into, you know, Damien, DMX Damien, uh, you got, he's a fighter plane. You got to just wait for him to gas out. 
and he ain't stopping him. So I did good. I, I think I love him. I love him. He's another one. Like him and Pun. Like, I don't mean, I got I got Pun there, and I got X over there on my other wall. You know, with, with my shrine. You know, my you know, with, with, with you know, with blessings, God's blessings. It's, those are two spirits that I was in their world, and I wasn't in their world like I was in their world more to help them, like to be a guidance, and then to learn as well. Like those were like profitable people. Like prophets, not profit. Prophetic, not profitable. Sorry, let's rephrase that. Prophetic people, not profitable. It's such a blessing to have know that you were ha- having a, such a part in their story, right? Yeah, everybody's story. Cuban, Pun, Joe, even Don Amar, Spanish rapper Don Amar, Dago. Daddy Yankee before he even blew up. He used to run around with me in Cuban. <laughs> it's good. Uh, Nicky Jams, all of them. Even I think Bruno Mars, one time we did a show, he was nobody. And, and even Bruno Mars, we, we, we remember we show him love. Like never, it was all love. Bruno Mars. Look at that kid. That kid is like incredible. Like I've been around, I've been, I've been blessed, bro. Like I ain't tripping. You know what I mean, I, I know God is going to continue to put more blessings in. If he wants me back in that world, I'll be in that world. I'm, I think I, I know how to do the job. You know, I, what I think is, is so amazing is that you you had your experience with Pun and you had your experience with X and they both just loved people, right? That, that, so, that tells you, so that tells you about me. I love people. I, I, I don't believe like, you know, we should you know, be enemies towards each other forever. Like, of course, we will have our differences and our disputes. And as long as we have an understanding, we don't have to, we don't have to talk every day, but we have an understanding. And anybody around our circle should understand, have the understanding as well. Like, even if they see me, even if one of my guys will see you and they ain't going to be like, Panda, nah, or whatever, you know what I mean? Or whatever, just the nod or, you know. Yeah, man, I just want to thank you for taking time out of your day to really chop it up with me. You know, I really appreciate it, Gilly. I'm here, brother. Like, whoever this fits this, wear it. Whoever don't, I get it. I've read in some comments from before, like, oh, dude's just better because he lost. Like, I'm good, dog. I'm good. I'm, I'm, ha- I'm healthy. And as long as you're healthy, you're rich. Money don't make you rich. Health makes you rich. So I'm healthy. I'm good. I got a roof over my head. I got a nice TV. I'm good. I got a, I got a job. <laughs> and I got a clothing line called Pude. As you can see, this hat is butter. Yeah. Uh, stands for, stands, it stands for peace, unity, righteousness, and equality. Where you see fire, you see smoke. That's dope, man. Um. Yeah, you're right about the the health. You know, that's that's just you can't even put a price on that. You know, money come, money go. And you know, I don't understand why people would say that you're bitter because, like, I've seen nothing but positive things that you've had to say. Pretty much, you know, from the this interview to the Doggy Diamonds interview, it doesn't come across as hateful or anything like that at all. Why should it? It is what it is, bro. Like, that was Joe's ship. That was his realm. I was there working. Cuban was a great artist, is a great artist. His his dream and his goal was for all of us to stay together after Pun died. I, that came out of his mouth. Now we got to stay together. You know, now things we got to get together. And, and, and it went and opposite. So it is what it is, bro. I saw it. You know, most of the original dudes, they ain't even there no more. You know, maybe one or two. But most of the original dudes ain't there. Only, you know, I mean, Tony Sunshine over there. Remy, Remy Armageddon, Prospect. You know, and, that, you know, they, um, 
It's on them, though. They touring. They, they, I don't know what they doing. You got to interview them, see what they doing. See if they successful, if they have mansions, if they all well set and mansions and they got, you know, their kids' bank accounts are full, are full and, you know, I doubt it. But, you know, hopefully they will. I know that uh, you're pretty cool with Los de Prez, right? We are. Smart. We, we, we are. But we are. We cool. We cool, but he's always on one side, I'm on the other. I'm just trying to come for some type of, you know, I advocate for Cuban. Like, why don't y'all, all y'all niggas mind your business and let Joe and him talk? That's it. Mind all everybody, mind your business. I'm the only one on this side with Cuban, dog. Like from the original crew, I'm the only one over here. Like let like them niggas talk it out, dog. Them niggas take a walk and talk, dog. That's what real niggas do. Everybody wanna be in the mix. Like, come on, man. But I get it. When you the king, you the king. You no, know? but no surprise. And you don't foresee huh? that happening though, right? You don't foresee them ever squashing it? I, I, I wish it could. I don't know how it's going to be, but I don't see it right now because nobody wants to step up and have a conversation. Everybody else is having a conversation about it. <laughs> Mine is the two dudes that need to be talking about it. You feel me? Everybody else talking about what these two dudes need to talk about. You feel me? Nobody business. That's my. That was my whole shit. My whole shit's nobody's fucking business, bro. It's our business, my nigga. The world knows about it more than us. The world is, is bothered because look, the world is mixed. They, 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 but and it's twenty three years. So we talking people 30, 40, 50 years old listening to these kind of conversations. Am I going to have an illiterate conversation about the whole situation, brother? Or am I going to show growth and elevation? Oh man! And when I when I talk to Cuban about it, I feel like. You know, there needs to be accountability on both sides. And I don't, I don't think Joe wants to, to do that. To, like, show his side of it of, like, you know, live up to maybe if he did blackball Cuban, I don't think he would admit it. And, you know, Cuban, him and I had a good conversation, and he says that he, he was at fault for some things in that situation. You know? Because I stand for what I believe in. I, and, you know, and I believe in my talent. And I'm yeah. my talent, and 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 that's one thing I had to really let go of, as far as like the energy of that dark energy uh, that was stopping me from um, from really becoming, the, you know, being an artist that I, I know I was meant to be. You know, what I'm saying to, to to attack certain songs and go into certain topics, you know, instead of just getting caught up in that beef shit and in, in, in that negative yeah. world, Back. in that dark side, like he says. You know, what I'm saying <laughs> they don't fuck with the dark side. I fuck with the light side. I fuck with the light. So, uh, so that, you know, I'll take blame for that. You know what I'm saying? Because that's that's been definitely hindering my uh, my uh, my shit. But it's part of my it's Your part story? of who I am. It's, it's yeah. part of my story. So I have to say what I say because if there's any questions or any uh, narratives that were put out there that's not true, I have to correct them. And that's just what we're doing right now. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm sure you didn't know all this shit. No. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I have to let you know that. Yeah, well, he, he admitted, and that's and that shows growth and elevation again. See. That's what we just said. See, I I I, I foresaw what you was about to say, Doc. Because <laughs> he just showed he just showed his growth and elevation. Yeah. Maybe maybe Joe feel like he ain't do nothing wrong because that was his plan all the way. So he did it right. The way he is is how he wanted it to be then. But what Cuba showed you was growth and elevation. You know, everybody make mistakes. You know what I mean? How do you grow from it? How do you? Why do Wu Tang, thirty years later, still together? They got cartoons, they got movies on them, and and, and even though they don't hang out every day, met the man went with, uh, with with Red Man, and then they do their own shit, and nobody bothered there, and everybody eats, and everybody happy if you call on one, yo, I need you to come, you know, it's there to support. Hip hop is supposed to be a family, and ain't no family in this shit. Everybody want. The dollar, I don't care. Niggas, are, niggas, are shoot their own mother for that dollar right now. That's sad too, man. Yeah, yeah. All these young rappers, man. I see it every day, dog. I work in the city. I work. I work in the hospital. 
I, I deal with all the gunshots that come into into my hospital, and my hospital is the number one trauma center in New York, number three in the nation. I see dudes with their chest open all day, young boys, and I'm like, hey, Doc, this is what gang is all about, man. I feel like in your line of work, you must see it way more than than the average person, right? Because even though it's normalized in the environment that you grow up in, you know, the inner city, it's not really something that should be normalized, right? Like it, it's not nor it's not a normal thing that you should be hearing gunshots or seeing people die in front of you, knowing people that, you know, that go through this stuff, right? You know, just like all of that stuff, you shouldn't, it shouldn't be normalized, but it is. And I feel like so many people in the inner city have like undiagnosed PTSD. By far, it's not even normalized. You know what's abnormal? When you see the mother come in, when you see the brother that wants to retaliate, that's when you really see how, how, how hard and how hurtful the situation has become. When you see that mother yell out a, a yelch, not even a scream, a yelch that echoes through your whole body. And it's all because of how society is today that we're not teaching. Remember the old, old dusty niggas is old to dusty. So they, so that means their brains is foggy. So that you think you can't learn nothing from an old dusty nigga, nigga? You can learn a lot from an old dusty nigga. Cause he dusty because he already seen it all. He's, he, he left it. But you don't want to learn from the old dusty, so you want to dust it with your chest wide open, your fucking body is blue, your mother's crying, your brother wants to kill the world. Your sister over there, your baby mother with the baby, and your man's just starting to drink and smoke in front of the hospital and put your shirt, your name, put your face on a shirt. It's the only memory they're going to have of you. Come on, man. Fuck out of here. My man, I don't want that memory. My, memories, my memory with you should be a great memory, like the memories I have of my brothers that both died. I had great memories of Pine Joe. DMX Cuban. The Cuban is a smart guy, dog. Niggas know that. Niggas see me walking down the street. First thing, like, what's up with Cuban? He good. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> you feel me? Like, no, no, that's crazy. Niggas don't even sometimes just say, what's up with the Gilly? Like, yo, what up, Gilly? You're like, like yo, 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 what up, Gilly? Yo, what up with Cuban? He good money, dog. I love that nigga. I, you already know it. Now, people don't even see me sometimes. They see him. And them industry niggas, they damn sure see him when they see me. I'm in the street, niggas see me, the first thing they do, that nigga that hold down Cuban lane, that nigga Cuban, that nigga that we love Cuban. Yeah, so what I did, nigga, what happened? I did, what happened? I did. Nobody else did. <laughs> Nobody else did. So would you say that when Cuban got blackballed, that you were blackballed by Guilty by Association, in a way? Yeah. But it comes with it. Expect it. You expect that. <laughs> you expect that. You know, you try to show that, like, your bro, like, you know, it, it, it could possibly be fixed. But, you know, guilty by association, I'll take it. I went down, I went down with the team. I didn't sell out. Pun put me on, pun gave me my chance. Joe gave me a chance as well. But Pun gave me my chance. Cuban gave me my chance. I'm honorable, bro. I, I ain't loyal to the dollar. I'm loyal to the person. And I was loyal to Joe. As well as much as I'm loyal to Cuba, I was loyal to the situation. I want to see the team win. We the Lakers. I want to see the Lakers win every year. At least make the playoffs every year. We won a championship, and then the team was dismantled because we lost the Jordan of rap. Big pun. The Jordan of rap. 
what kind of uh, adversity did you did you guys run into after when you was just running with just you and Cuban? Like, were you guys putting out tapes and like it just wasn't being received well? Wasn't just getting plays or like what 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 was going on? Yeah, we was putting out mixed tapes. It wasn't um, I mean the hood, every hood had it. I remember God rest his soul. I don't even like to talk about it, but I remember I put it in case lay hand. And he didn't want to take it out my hand. He's like, nah, Gilly, I can't touch that. I'm like, word. I mean, him ain't talk for a little minute, but then we spoke again. But, you know, I, I I respected it. At that time, I was like, word, I ain't talked to him no more. I ain't talked to him no more. But then when we did Bang Bang Boogie, you know, he came around and I, I spoke to him then. And I was just like, that shit was whack what you did, dog. But I get it. That's how you felt. That's how you felt you was going to get on. Oh, bro. In this world, you need a sponsor. But to get into a certain society, you need a sponsor. You know? If you don't have a sponsor, if you're not sponsored by someone, even if you're, even if you're a, a up-and-coming star basketball player, to get that super contract, you need to be sponsored by an agent. No? So what was K Slay's response when you said that that was fucked up what you did? I don't know what his response was. He got rest his soul. He gone now, but he was just, uh, I was like, where? He was like, oh, I don't care. I'm like, where, dog? I just turned around and I walked away from him. I'm like, I get it. I mean, it's no more conversation. We was doing things together at that time, too. What happened with Bang Bang Boogie? Because it was looking like it was about to take off. I don't know. I don't know. It was about to take off, but then one day we're on Billboard magazine, 50 Cent promoting us, and then the next day the feds take down three quarters of the rappers on some indictment on some gang shit, and two of them beat the trial, and one of them, and two of them did time, one of them is still doing time. S1. Free S1 to God. That's my dog. Hocus, you know, but as soon as, come on, who could do that? Who could put, you know, three of, of the most talented Bronx rappers together with two great up-and-coming rappers and, and create a, a situation? God so my, my brother P.O. and me put that together with Hocus. But you got Lord Tariq, you got my son, you got Cuban Link. Those are, come on, that's, that's, that's the big three. You got the big three. Come on, man. You got the big three, then you got Hocus and S1. S1 was about to fly anyway, because he's different, right? So you got the big three with the two with, with, with the two new ones coming up. It was over. Bang Bang Boogie was crazy. But then from one day, it went from Billboard, and then the next day, the Feds took like three quarters of them niggas down on the team. But they beat it. They beat their trial, but they had to fight for five years to beat their trial. So we lost five years. Yeah, that definitely slowed down the momentum. And obviously that look from 50 was a good look too. Well, that's right. And that's why, and they asked, you know, I had a meeting not with him, but with Yayo. He was like, yo, you know, I guess I had to have a meeting with him before I met with Fib. He was like, what y'all want? I said, bro, we just want through the door. We just want to do music. We just want to get it through the door. Put that music out. You know what I mean? Whether it's with G-Unit, we would love it. We would love to be a part of this. I mean, and we was going to come out with hits. And then after that, you already know, Bang Bang Boogie, the label would have had every Bronx rapper coming out right now. And, you know, organizing it, maybe to the level that I taught you where, you know, maybe the label would have created a union where any rapper that came to the label would definitely have some, some, some social security after his tenure. Right. You feel me? Like, niggas, niggas is not dumb out here, dog. That's what other people understand. Like, I can speak the hood language all day long, bro, but, bro, bro niggas is versed. You know what I mean? Like, come on, dog. Like, look at 50. Look what he said. He said he had to go to Harvard, but everybody that works for him is in Harvard. The same thing. We all have the same hood thoughts. We all from the block. Everybody had a dream. You only get, you only there, you, you just hustle what you got growing up. Like, you know what I mean? Like, if you grew up in the South Bronx where everything was predominantly heroin growing up, what nine times out of ten, what you going to be doing? You're going to be a heroin dealer. You know what I mean? You're going to be in the drug game. That was before crack. 
So come on, man. So that's what New York was. New York was a moneymaker in, in the streets of it, the epidemic of drugs, but New York niggas did it different. The Chicago niggas did it different. LA niggas did it different. The niggas did it their own way, but they did it. And they always they always flew back and forth. Money niggas travel. What was the uh, experience like with Yayo? Was there like any possible signing with G-Unit? No, we just had a nice conversation. I gave him my thoughts and what we th- and and our thoughts and our belief, and then um, it was that was it. And then shortly after that was when they took the, the, the fellas down when they took them down. So it was like that's out the window. Because at one point, G Unit was looking at Cuban, right? Specifically, I heard that. No, I heard I heard something like that. I heard something like that. If that was true, that could be urban legend, though, but I'm not sure. Yeah, because Cuban was saying that he was shopping around like a, a bunch of labels, and that was one of them, but then it never panned out. Yeah, I shopped around. We shopped labels out there in, in L.A., and then niggas went over there and threw the monkey wrench in that system out there. So dudes was like, nah, we can't have a meeting. And, and then just a, a, a label in Florida, the dude was like, yo, I get threatened. So we're like, okay. Well, I guess, you know, keep fighting, keep doing, you know, mixtapes. And, you know, we just didn't really take full advantage of the of the social media market when it when it first came on board. We didn't really take full advantage on like how these kids, you know, are capitalizing on it today. Like it's the way of business, which is a smart move. But we didn't at the time. But to be fair, it wasn't at this level before either, though. So, I mean while you could have taken advantage of it a little more, I mean, now it's on a whole nother level now. But you say that the the label in Florida got threatened if they worked with you? Yeah, there was, yeah, there was a label that got threatened out there in Florida. There was a label in, in California that even, even the shit that WAC 100 say like that, that, um, that Cuban tried to get a deal with Suge Knight. Like, he ain't never tried to get a deal with Suge Knight. The real story is that David Mays called me, David Mays of the Source magazine, and said, how would we like to go and and be a, and have a meeting with Suge Knight that he wanted to meet, you know, to, to see if he signed him. And we was like, we, we, we sat down, we thought about it, and we looked at all the ramifications, and we were like, nah. It's all good. You know what I mean? So we never went to look for a deal with Suge Knight. He called Dave Mays. Dave Mays called me at the time. I don't even know where that dude is at. At the time. And he tried to ask us if we wanted to go to Suge Knight and have a meeting that we were offered that meeting by by him, David Mays and Suge Knight. So when WAC... 100 says that Cuban went over there. That shit is false, bro. Like, no. But he said that, like, more so, like, he went over there for protection more so than he he wanted a record deal. Because you guys had a little run-in before, right? Where he said that you went to death row. and you Lying. That was a lie, my nigga. That was a lie. That's why I know he's full of shit. You commented on that. You said that you didn't even know who he was at the time. I didn't know him. I don't know him. Still to this day, I never met this nigga. Never. He said that he met me. They know me. I went to Chuck's office. These lies. That's what I'm saying. These are all lies. Protection from who? No, bro. Protection from who, bro? We was we been going to LA, Doug. We been we we been going to LA. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, mess with Psycho Realm out there. You know what I'm saying? Psycho Realm shows us mad love when we was out there. You know, I got a relationship with them. I haven't seen them in a long, long time. There's a couple of dudes out there. My man Wavy. I haven't seen him in a long, long, long time. We, we, we you know, we was good, dog. Like, they, they know checking in. Respect, yeah, you check on your boys, people that you've done met. But to check in, to go for security, nah, dog. We was good wherever we went. Niggas in every state fuck with Cuban. Cuban got love, though. That's what people understand. Like, people got love. Cuban got love, man. Every state we go to, we got love. And I think that that's what was uh, kind of offensive to Cuban Link because he was like, bro, like we didn't try to get no protection or anything. And, and Wack just kept on 
get in on that. Yeah, but you see, whack. But, but you see, whack is gonna antagonize him. But see, but like, if I tell whack, like, David Mays called me, bro. Like it was David Mays that put that together. So where you get where you get your story from? Right. Like he tried to put that together, and we didn't do it. And you know, uh, I interviewed Reggie Wright Jr., right? Former general manager at Death Row. And I asked him specifically, he was on and off with Death Row, but I asked him specifically, do you remember Cuban Link going to Death Row trying to ask for protection or trying to ask for anything? And he says that he he couldn't, you know, confirm that or not. For what? Like, for what? Why would we go to Death Row for to, for protection when, 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 when we are our own men? Like we're all men, dog. Like, like, well, what kind of world niggas y'all living in? Like, what kind of world y'all living in? What the fuck, I gotta go to another man to protect me. Ain't my fucking daddy. You know what I mean? That should be disrespectful when niggas say shit like that, bro. Like, come on, like, nah, bro. You you go to different stages. You got peoples, bro. You yeah, of course you go check on your people. You you know you you. you it's like me visiting you. I'm I'm in your town. Your pen. I'm in your town. What up, dog? Oh, yo, what up, yo, come through, whatever. That's the love we've built through years. It's not like, you know, nowadays is a different different way, I guess. You know, that, that niggas got to check in. It's putting pressure on these little niggas because these little niggas is about nothing. You know, you got to walk when you a bit. Look at Jay-Z. Did he check in? Think Floyd Mayweather check in with all them 30 goons he got on them, the big seven-foot niggas with, with rifles? Nigga, you checked in, nigga. I'm checked in. Yeah, I got my team with me. I got my headers with me too. Yeah, hey, what's up, y'all? Hey, love. It's all love, man. All this, all this separation of our people shit got to go out the window. Yeah, I think that that's what was so crazy about when Wack was saying all of that, you know, because Wack wasn't even there. I never seen Wack when we used to go to LA, and unless he was with them, I know we used to be around Mac Ten and and, and Wavy, who banging. We used to be around them. You know, some of the brothers that, that have left this earth, God, God rest, they sold some real niggas out there. You know, some real LA dudes. You know what I mean? But that's just like you come into New York and you fuck with New York niggas, niggas that a whole way to five boroughs, niggas that are known in five boroughs. If you're known in five boroughs, you got money. I mean, you go anywhere you want. I don't know where this shit came to, you can't go. Any way you want. Most of the rappers that died in LA, they got set up by their own mans. It wasn't nobody outside that came ahead of them. It was their own, their own side, their own team ahead of them from the inside. Yeah. So why did you guys decide not to have that meeting with Suge? For what? For what? You didn't you didn't think that a, a deal with Death Row would be beneficial for the For what? It wouldn't have been beneficial. It would it wouldn't have been beneficial. We already had a record deal. Cuban got an independent deal with a with a group of people, and he named his own label Mob Records. So he he fought enough to get his own independent situation with his own label, like you know. So Dave Mays of the source specifically called and asked if you guys wanted to meet me. Me. He called me. Why do you think that he was the one that that was trying to broker that? Got it. Got me. That's crazy. You never know what it could have been though. Could have been it would have would it have been another Biggie Tupac? Mm. See, people don't think like that, dog. I can open up a can of fucking worms all day long, bro, because niggas ain't stupid. You know, niggas ain't thirsty, bro. Like, niggas is like, bro, you are, we already on. Like, how much more on you want to get just because you got a little more notoriety? You're already on the planet. <laughs> you have the same ability everybody else does. I think after all that has happened between you and Joe, that there's a part of you that really does love Joe because you knew him at such a young age, right? 
Well, I mean, I got, I got love for him. I ain't gonna tell y'all love him. I, I, I got, I, I got love for him, man. Like I got, in a sense. Let me for let me let me know fix that. Dog. I got love for everybody, dog. I got I, and I love everybody that I come across my life. So I treat you how you treat me. If you don't got no love for me, then I get it. I'm still gonna love you, but that one part of me ain't gonna have no love for you. That's it. Like I, I just hope it don't never go that route. You feel me? Like it should never. I don't have no ill will for nobody. If you don't like me, that's your fucking opinion. Eat it, nigga. Deal with it. I'm still going to be here till God takes me out of here. By your hand or by whoever else's hand. But I'm going to live. Whether I'm dead or alive, my legacy is going to live forever. When was the last time that you spoke to Joe? 23 years ago. You you never seen him from around the way since then? Seen him one time, but we ain't no words. Gotcha. So I want to end this on a, a positive note. What is your... Hasn't it, hasn't it been positive? Yeah, it's been positive, but I want to end it on a real positive note. <laughs> on a happy note. On a happy note. Sorry. Let me, let me fix that. I want to end this on a, on a happy note. Um... What is your favorite memory of Big Pun? Um, my favorite memory of Big Pun? Watching the Titanic a thousand times. The movie? He used to always watch it. That's what he... That, that's so here. I didn't like it, but I had to watch it a thousand times. Every time it was on, we watched it. So, what did he like about that movie so much? I guess, I guess the love part of it. Love, man. Pun, pun, pun. Just love, man. The guy had a great heart. Pun, love, man. And if you could say one thing to pun today, what would you say? I do. I tell him every day I love him. I do. I talk to him every day. He's right here. He's right, right there. So I see him every day. I look at him and I, I talk to him. He's here spiritually with me, man. You know what I mean? Like he's he's in the spirit. Tell him to watch my watch over me. Watch over all of us. Actually, watch over all of us. And you know that's you know probably why nobody is disrespected on either side because of the love one had and his influence on how he would have been like, nah, I ain't right. You no, know, that shit between us, that shit ain't nobody business. Pun would have made that clear. That shit ain't leaving this room. Are there any uh, untold stories from about Pun that you got? Nah, I think y'all heard them all. <laughs> what about uh, what about Cuban? Mm, I like to keep my stories to myself. Those are memories. <laughs> I've had I've had great I've had great experiences with Cuban as well. We've had a lot of fun, and we've had a lot of tough, rough times, and and great situations. And it's my bro, man. You know he deserves a chance, bro. Bottom line, like he just got to put out music. That's my thing. Is just just, just put out a song every week. Just flood it. Just flood the internet, flood the internet with freestyles, jack beats, take old school beats, take beats, and just fucking do a freestyle and just just keep just just keep flooding, just build content, more and more content. Because at the end of the day, you know, look, twenty three years later, and they're still talking about you, bro. And I told him, I said that, bro, like you should be a, a content creator, like do live streams then, and and talk about current hip hop situations you could relate it to the past too if you want but like you got the personality to do it people really like his personality you know he's entertaining as hell it's funny as heck he's funny he makes me laugh i, I like his little videos where he be doing a little baby face like you're the you seen the one where he did the with the little kid don't worry about a thing and the father singing on his page you, you ever seen little, you seen that one yeah they got the big, funny, big face, father head, and 
Yo, bro, I watched that today. When I want to laugh, I just go to that, and I'll be like, yo, this fucking kid is retarded. But that's how pun was. That's how he was, and that that that's that's part of pun. Like he still has that part. Like he's crazy. They funny like that. And um, I wish him the best. He's my bro. I call him often. You know, we don't talk often, but you know, I always send him a text and say hello, and you know what I mean? Because you know, and says I do the same with says. What happened to says? Says is good, man. You know, says is you know. Say so he stepped away from music, like he fell back on it, or what? Well, I mean, he 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 still does his music, but that's not his priority. His priority is you know he works, you know he's working and he gets paid good money, and you know he's that's his focus right now. And he's trying to get his money. He's trying to get his ass cap money and all that money in his words. He's he's fighting for it right now. He don't really do interviews, right? But he's going through because I don't think I've ever seen one from him. He. He has it. Say, 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 low. Say, was all the talent. It was say who who started the the fact that that pun started rhyming and writing rhymes like that. It was say. Wow. Say did that. That's a story. But I hope I I hope I, I entertained y'all enough, man. Like I ain't talking bad about nobody. It's not what I'm here to do, dog. But I'm actually my loud smoking some shit. So I hope this interview was worth your while, dog. Bro, it's definitely worth it, man. You know, definitely worth to to build with you and, and just get another different perspective. You know, I, I feel like because I had, you know, interviewed uh Cuban, I interviewed Charlie, and you know, they kind of have a similar perspective of Joe. And I wanted to get a different perspective because I don't want it to just look like Oh, this is just Bash Joe, Bash Joe. You know what I mean? Like that's not what it's really about. It's like, um, I mean, I mean, bro, there's no, there's no reason, to, there's no reason to bash nobody. Um, of course, we all have our feelings. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm over mine. You know, niggas know what they did, dog. That's it. You know, niggas know what happened. Niggas know what they did. Like it was for us to continue the legacy like we you're supposed to be able to create your own you know label one day and bring your own artists along of course you got to pay homage and and and, you know but you know it's nobody got an opportunity you know and some people um didn't take advantages of the opportunity and if they did they thought they were doing the right thing and wound up being wrong sometimes you think you're doing the right thing and it's all, all wrong right 